Hello and uh, welcome to the uh, Synchrotron Computed Microtomography Virtual Hands-On Tutorial. Uh, I'm Mark Rivers. Uh, I'm with the University of Chicago, um, where I uh, am the director of the Center for Advanced Radiation Sources. And I uh, work at one of the beam lines at the Advanced Photon Source at Fargon National Lab. Um, and today I'm speaking to you from uh, Argonne. Um, I am actually in my office. Normally for experiments like this, uh, I'd be out at the beam line um, in most of the time, but uh, that would require right now wearing a mask, uh, which is not fun for a presentation like this. And also it's, it's rather noisy out there. So I'm gonna do most of this from my office um, but we will be going out to the beam line uh, where I'll uh, pick up the blue jean session on my phone and um, be able to uh, show you uh, the, the beam line and we'll change samples and so on and then come back to my office to actually um, <clears throat> control the experiment. And I'm going to now share my screen. So, uh, as I said, my name's Mark Rivers, and I um, want to thank uh, Yen Bin Wang and Tim Officer Manchu and Charlie Smith, who are helping me with this uh, today. It's the first time, you know, we've done anything like this, so hopefully the technology will work. Um, I, I want to say that I want to keep this informal and, and uh, for sure, um, would like to entertain any questions. You can ask questions either by um, typing into the chat window. Yanbin's keeping an eye on that and he'll let me know if there are questions there. Um, you can um, do it also in uh, the, uh, in the, by the raise, raise hand icon under the people tab on the right of your screen. Um, or you could just unmute your microphone and, and uh, ask a question out loud. I would ask that you please all keep your microphones muted um, and when you're not asking a question. Okay, so, uh, and, and uh, I, this is the first day of this. I'm gonna offer the same class again tomorrow because uh, we had a total of uh, about 70 people who registered for this. So we've got about half and half each day. So the, uh, the schedule I sent to you, uh, it's, it's um, going to be roughly an hour uh, talk that I'm going to give uh, now. Then we'll have a 10-minute break or so. Oops, somebody's, yeah. Uh, mute. Um, and uh, then we'll go out to the beam line and uh, show you the beam line, uh, mount some samples. We'll come back here and uh, Doug Schmidt, whose samples they are, will give a little talk about, uh, you know, why he wants to measure these. Uh, and then we'll actually measure, make measurements on uh, one or more of those samples as time permits. Then we'll have another break and we'll uh, then pick up with uh, a brief talk on an overview of how to reconstruct the data that we've just collected. Then we will actually reconstruct it. And then hopefully there'll be some time at the end for a discussion. Um, and, uh, but as I say, I wanna keep this uh, uh, interactive. So if you've got questions, I think 30, 35 people is enough. It's kind of like a big classroom. There should be uh, ability to handle questions. So in this talk, this is a, a brief outline of the talk, I'm basically gonna you know, introduce synchrotron radiation sources for non-experts, because some of you may have only ever used laboratory uh, tomography sources, or you may not have used tomography sources at all. Uh, talk a bit about the advantages of synchrotrons for imaging and tomography. Then get into a description of the beam line that we actually run here at the advanced photon source, the different types of computed tomography that we do at these beam lines and then some details about the apparatus that we'll be using this afternoon, how we collect the data, and uh, then ending with actually collecting data on the real samples. 
Uh, so we're at, <clears throat> I'm at, I should say, the Advanced Photon Source at Argonne National Laboratory. Uh, the Advanced Photon Source, or APS, is a 7 GeV high brightness electron storage ring. Uh, the scale here is the, the diameter of the ring is about 1.1, I'm sorry, the circumference of the ring is about 1.1 kilometers. And it's got a, a round a tangential to the ring are the X-ray beam lines. And there are all together about 70 of those that can be running all at the same time. And they do all sorts of different kinds of X-ray experiments from X-ray spectroscopy to X-ray scattering, X-ray imaging that we're going to be doing today uh, and in numbers of other techniques. And um, so about half of these beam lines are run by the APS themselves and the other half uh, are run by outside groups. And we are one of those outside groups. We're nearby, we're from the University of Chicago, uh, but the University of Chicago actually runs seven of the beam lines uh, at the APS. And I'm particularly uh, associated with a, a set of beam lines called GSE cars, which stands for Geo Soil Enviro Center for Advanced Radiation Sources. Um, and that's sector 13 at the APS. And that's where I am right now. And um, so what are some of the properties of synchrotron radiation? First of all, it's, it's tunable and it covers a very wide uh, range of wavelengths or energies um, from actually the radio to the infrared to the visible UV, vacuum ultraviolet, and then hard x-rays. Um, the APS is designed really to be the premier source in the country for hard x-rays. So there are no infrared beam lines at the APS and synchrotrons are not really use, used in the visible because lasers are so much better. Um, but, uh, but, it, but they are used in the infrared because they, they uh, are a, a very good source in that wavelength. Um, they, synchrotron radiation has, is, is very bright, uh, which means the radiation is highly collimated. It's coming out in a small angle and it comes from a small source. The source of the X-rays is the electron beam in the accelerator, and they have managed to make the electron beam in this accelerator very small. Um, with the, the, the highly collimated means there are lots of photons in a small spot. There, the fact that it's coming from a small source means you can then you can also focus it very well with X-ray optics and put a lot of photons into a very small spot indeed. Um, the radiation is polarized, so polarization can either be linear or circular or tunable. Uh, it has a time structure, so it's not a DC source like an X-ray tube. Um, and the APS actually has a very interesting time structure where there is about 170 nanoseconds between pulses, and the pulses are only about 100 picoseconds long. So there are numbers of experiments at the APS that take advantage of the fact that it's a time pulsed source. Uh, the experiments we're doing today do not take advantage of that. It treats it as a, uh, at, and it, in the normal mode that they fill the machine, it's the, the pulses are coming by our beam line or the X-rays are coming down in our beam line in pulses at about five megahertz. And the, the synchrotron radiation is partially coherent. It doesn't have the coherence of a laser, um, but it is not, but it does have some coherence, which is very useful. So <clears throat> synchrotron radiation is emitted by relativistic electrons, electrons whose uh, energy is close or, or so that they're, uh, um, they're traveling very close to the speed of light. And um, one measure of a, a dimensionless measure of that is this figure called gamma. Uh, which is the ratio of the relativistic mass of the electron to its rest mass. And that can be uh, calculated as 1957 times the energy of the machine in billion electron volts. And the APS, as I said, is a seven billion electron volt um, uh, machine. 
Um, this value gamma is, is important because one over gamma is approximately equal to the full width half max opening angle of the synchrotron radiation at some characteristic critical energy. And that critical energy is given by um, a constant near one times the square of the energy of the machine times the magnetic field of whatever uh, magnet is accelerating the beam. <clears throat> and you know that this could be a bending magnet as the beam goes around a corner or a periodic magnet array, which I'll mention in a minute. And there, here, here I've listed three of the synchrotrons in the US. Um, the advanced light source at Berkeley, which is the lowest energy machine here at 1.9 GeV, NSLS2 at Brookhaven at 3 GeV, and the APS at 7. And these are the values of gamma, and these are the values of 1 over gamma in micro radians. So you see the intrinsic opening angle of the APS is 73 micro radians. And that means that at a, mic, at, a, at a meter from the source, the beam would be 73 microns tall. At 100 meters, it would be 7.3 millimeters tall. An APS bending magnet, which is what we're gonna be using today, um, has that opening angle. So the beam is about four millimeters in our station at the critical energy, which is about 20 kilo electron volts. And I'll get into this a little more. So <clears throat> there are two main sources of synchrotron radiation. The first is called the bending magnet or dipole magnets. These are the magnets that keep the beam circulating in its more or less circular orbit around uh, the accelerator. Actually, the APS is not a circle. And what it is is a 40-sided polygon um, with bends between the straights. So imagine a 40-sided polygon with, with curved corners. And those bending magnets make up the curved corners. And then there are periodic magnetic devices called insertion devices, of which there are two kinds, wigglers, which have a high magnetic field or a large period. And so the electron beam undergoes a, an angular deviation that's significantly greater than one over gamma. The, an undulator, is a very similar device, but it has a, a lower field and a smaller period so that the ang electron beam angular deviation is less than about one over gamma. And in an undulator, this causes the radiation from one pole of the periodic device to the next to interfere constructively or destructively. So you get peaks in the, in the energy spectrum and peaks and valleys in the energy spectrum. So this is just a little cartoon about how X-rays are produced in a synchrotron. So this is the relativistic electron coming into a bending magnet. And as it goes around this corner, it's emitting into one over gamma, which is a very small angle, as I said, but it's like the train, the, the searchlight on a train as it goes around this corner, it sweeps out a big beam in the horizontal direction, whereas in the vertical direction, its opening is like one over gamma. And these multicolors here are intended to show that it's a broad bandwidth polychromatic beam. It's not dispersed in energy as it looks like it is here. The energy every point along that bend is the same, the energy spectrum. <clears throat> this is you know, schematically what an undulator looks like. And the beam is going through this undulator, oscillating back and forth, back and forth, each time it accelerates around these corners, it emits radiation. The radiation interferes constructively or destructively. And what you get out is a beam that is very highly collimated in both the horizontal and vertical directions with an opening angle that's much less than one over gamma. So an undulator beam at the APS 60 meters from the source is, is a, roughly a millimeter, maybe two millimeters in size. And its, its intensity is increased dramatically over a bending magnet. So here's a, a schematic that shows the, the sweeping searchlight of a bending magnet, the incoherent superposition of a wiggler, and the coherent 
interference from an undulator with much smaller opening angle. And these are schematically the spectra. So a bend magnet is this solid or line near the bottom here. The wiggler is up here. This is a log vertical scale. So if this, if this wiggler has 30 poles, um, 30 magnets, it, it will be 30 times as intense as a bending magnet. And because the magnetic field is a little different, its energy spectrum is slightly different. If the magnetic field were the same, it would simply be 30 times more than a bending magnet. And then finally, the undulator has these very sharp spikes in energy where the, at these peak values, the, the intensity is 100 times more than a wiggler at that energy. Um, but then in the valleys, there's virtually no, there are virtually no photons. These peaks can be shifted around by opening and closing the gap on the undulator, changing the magnetic field. And this is just a summary of brightness, um, which I'll describe in a minute, but it's basically flux per unit source per area, unit area per unit source area. And, you know, x-ray tubes are down here at say 10 to the seventh, maybe 10 to the eighth for a rotating anode. Bending magnets are here, four orders of magnitude higher. Wigglers are say six orders of magnitude. Undulators, eight to 10 orders of magnitude. And then finally, free electron lasers, which is the APS is not um, up above that. So what the, the, the storage ring of the APS looks like, um, it's um, a, a basically 1.1 kilometer close packed array of magnets. Um, the red magnets here are the dipole magnets or those bending magnets that I talked about. These blue magnets here are focusing magnets to keep the electron beam as small as we can keep it. And this is one of those undulators. It's a massive structure because there's a very strong magnetic force um, uh, acting on these poles as you open and close it. And we need to open and close the gap with micron precision. So this is that periodic array. This is a plot of the intensity of a bunch of different sources. You, you only need to pay attention to the black lines here, which are the APS. And the, this solid black line at the bottom is the, an APS bending magnet. And intensity is just the, the flux per unit um, solid per unit bandwidth. So it's how many photons are, are in the beam, a, a solid angle, a unit solid angle of the beam, irrespective of the size of the source. And so a bending magnet is here and an APS undulator, which we also use at Jesse Cars at Sector 13, this APS U33 um, is, is here. So you see it's um, three orders of magnitude more intense um, than the bending magnet. Um, this is brightness where we now take into account the size of the source as well as the flux per unit ang angle. And um, here's the bending magnet, here's the undulator, again, um, you know, three orders of magnitude higher. The dashed lines on here are what's gonna happen to the APS um, in about two years when it's gonna shut down and have an upgrade and the electron beam is going to get much smaller. Um, and so the brightness is going to go way up on these undulators. It actually goes up on the bending magnet significantly as well. So this is the bending magnet after the APS upgrade. This is the bending magnet now. For the experiments that we're talking about today where we don't focus the source, the gain on the bending magnet will not be very much. In fact, if I look at the previous slide, the flux per unit area from the upgrade and today crosses at about 45. So we gain below 45 keV and we lose above, but it's all within a factor of two. And here's just uh, some figures for the, for the bending magnet at the APS. And, and you could just pay attention to this column here. So the size, the vertical full width half max of, of the beam is about six and a half millimeters in our station at 20 keV, and it's about 2.6 millimeters at 100 keV. So you see the opening angle gets smaller with higher energy. Uh, and the number of photons per unit bandwidth also drops significantly as we go up in energy by you know, more than an order of magnitude. 
This is the ABS upgrade over here. It just shows the beam is a little bigger with the upgrade, but, but not much, only, you know, uh, uh, less than 10%. So why do we want to use synchrotrons for X-ray imaging? Well, as I said, the source is bright, intense, well collimated with a small source. So for full field imaging, which is the kind of thing we're doing today, uh, we have a lot of flux per solid angle in the beam. Um, for, for some other kinds of tomography where we need to make a pencil beam, such as fluorescence or diffraction, um, the brightness matters because we can focus that beam to a small spot, you know, a micron or well under a micron. The X-ray spectrum from a synchrotron bending magnet is continuous. So with, we can put a monochromator in the beam that selects a single energy. And so we can optimize uh, for a specific sample thickness and composition or to excite a specific element in our sample by going to its absorption edge. Uh, and we can scan the energy for doing you know, what's called XAFs or X-ray absorption fine structure. If we take out the monochromator, we can get 10 to the four times more flux for doing high speed imaging or efficient excitation of a lot of elements for fluorescence. The source is partially coherent, which is useful for phase contrast imaging that I'll discuss. It's a parallel beam that avoids artifacts due, due to cone beam geometry. Um, and, and that's what a laboratory CT source has, is cone beam. And that has unavoidable artifacts, particularly at large cone angles. And then finally, there are high energy X-rays that come from the synchrotron, particularly the APS, good for studying relatively thick samples or high atomic number samples. Uh, but I should say that even the high energy X-rays at the APS, it's not as good as a very high energy like industrial X-ray tube, where which is designed for you know X-raying welds in a in a pipe or something like that, this, that's not what the synchrotron excels at. So this is a schematic of our sector 13 at the APS. We have two beam lines. We have an undulator beam line that's here, and um, it has um, three experimental stations, a microprobe here, a big diffractometer here, and a high pressure station here with a laser heated diamond anvil cell and a thousand ton multi-anvil press. Um, and then we have a bending magnet beam line here, and that's split into two. There's a side station here, BMC, which is got a big diffractometer as well. And it's used for surface scattering and diamond anvil cell experiments. And then there's the end station, which is where we're going to be working today. And that's got a tomography station and a smaller 250 ton multi-anvil press. And these are the techniques we run at Jesse Cars. So we've got an X-ray microprobe for doing trace elements and fluorescence and diffraction microtomography, a diffractometer that's used for surface scattering, other experiments as well, uh, a laser heated diamond anvil cell and a thousand ton press that are used for doing uh, diffraction experiments and spectroscopy and radiography experiments at high pressures. On the bending magnet, we've got that smaller press, which is used also for doing tomography, and I'll talk about that, and diffraction. It's, and we have a diamond anvil cell where we do what's called Brewan spectroscopy. But importantly for today, it's where we do the computed microtomography. So the computed microtomography here shares the time with two other techniques. So we don't run this tomography apparatus all the time. It runs roughly a third of the time on the beam line. And then finally, there's this station on the side station on the bending line. So in that end station, BMD, um, that we're gonna be running in today, there are three different modes we can run. We can run with white beam, which means there are no X-ray optics except slits and perhaps absorbers. So we're basically taking the beam directly from the storage room. We can run with monochromatic beam, which means we put in a high resolution silicon 111 double crystal monochromator. That has a very narrow energy bandwidth, of approximately 10 to the minus four delta E over E, which means we're throwing away 99.99% of the X-rays but it gives us a very narrow energy bandwidth, which is good for a lot of experiments. 
And then finally, the way we're going to be running today is with what's called pink beam. So pink beam is white beam that's been reflected from a mirror. And it's called pink by analogy with visible light because the mirror only reflects the low energy or long wavelength uh, x-rays. So by analogy with visible light, that would be the red. And so it's, getting, it's, it's passing the red and getting rid of the blue, so it's called pink. Uh, mirror optics are achromatic. So with this mirror, we can focus all energies at the same place. And, and with this mirror, we can focus either pink beam or monochromatic beam, but today we're gonna to be using the mirror with pink beam. And the mirrors also allows defocusing the beam to increase the size for imaging. So um, this mirror can be bent either directions, and I'll get to that. And of course, focusing with mirrors can greatly increase the flux on the sample. Um, so this is a, a picture of the uh, a schematic of, of how an X-ray mirror works. So X-rays that are incident on a solid here will be reflected if the angle they make with the mirror is less than a critical angle. And those critical angles are small. So for instance, at 10 keV, the critical angle for silicon is three milliradians, which is about a sixth of a degree. And for nickel, it's about a third of a degree. And for gold, it's about a half a degree. So anything below that, uh, the angle will reflect at 10 keV. Anything uh, above 10 keV will not be reflected. So this is showing um, at three milliradians for silicon, nickel, and platinum, where the mirror reflection cuts off in energy. Um, this is a schematic showing how we would focus the beam. So we, we take our mirror, which is down here. This is the source, the electron beam on the left. This is our mirror, which is we're bending to be a piece of this ellipse, which has the source at one focus and the sample at the other focus. Remember, uh, an ellipse focuses a point to a point. So by bending this mirror, we can take all the photons that come out of this source that hit the mirror and focus them to this point. And we demagnify this source by the ratio of F1 to F2. That's what the mirror in this beamline was designed to do, where we bend it to this ellipse. Today, what we're doing is we're actually bending the mirror the wrong way. So instead of bending it to be a um, <clears throat> concave shape here, we're bending it to be a convex shape, at which point it blows the beam up and makes it bigger on the sample than it would have otherwise been. It's just a photograph uh, of the mirror. It's a, it's a little over a meter long. It's in ultra high vacuum. And then in vacuum, it's got this bending mechanism uh, to, to uh, with two point bender, uh, we can bend it to a very close to that ideal elliptical shape. Um, so when we run in pink beam in BMD as we are today, we've got some slits upstream and downstream that are water cooled because there's a lot of power in this beam. We've got some absorption filters that are also water cooled and those can be used to get rid of some of the low energy photons. And then we've got this mirror. Um, which is 1.2 meters long, about a meter of it is the good optical quality. It bounces the beam down, it's platinum coated, and we can adjust the pitch, the angle, um, for the, where the energy cutoff is and bend it to control whether it focuses or defocuses. So this is a, a plot of a spectrum, and there are three, three curves shown here. Uh, the black curve, is the, um, is the spectrum out of the bending magnet um, itself um, it, with, with, with no, nothing in the way. Um, and so this is the intensity of the beam. And it's, um, you see it, uh, it, it has a peak here at around 20 keV. And um, then it falls off naturally on the high energy side and also on the low energy side. Um, the blue is what happens if we put a millimeter of aluminum in that beam. So you see at high energy, the aluminum does almost nothing. Whoops, sorry. 
uh, but at low energy, it's cutting off almost all the photons below about 20 keV, 15 keV. And then finally, if we if we also reflect that beam from this mirror at an angle of three milliradians, um, we get this red spectrum here. So the low energy side is being controlled by the aluminum absorber and the high energy side by the reflection from the mirror. So we've basically made a broad bandwidth beam here that's about, let's say 15 keV or so, full width half max. So the integrated number of photons under that curve is very high. Um, whereas if we were using a monochromator, it would be um, you know, a, basically a very, very narrow um, vertical line here up to this black curve at that intensity. So, um, but, but the integrated number of photons, because the, the, the width is so narrow, is small. This green line actually shows you the iodine K absorption edge, which is at about 33 keV. Okay, so this is a blow up of the layout of the beam line, um, showing that up here is where we have these water cooled filters. Then there's a slit, water cooled slit. This is that silicon 111 double crystal monochromator. It's about 27 meters from the source. Then we have another set of vertical slits here. This is that vertical focusing or defocusing mirror, a final set of slits in the station, and I'll show those to you uh, on my phone in a little while. This is the table where we do the tomography experiments, and then this is the 250 ton press at the back of the hutch. So schematically, this is what the tomography system looks like. Basically have a rotation stage that rotates the sample, uh, a beam of x-rays that fully illuminates the sample, the x-rays hit a scintillator where the x-ray signal is converted to visible light. And then we have a microscope objective or other type of lens that images the, sh the shadow of the sample on the scintillator onto a camera. And um, so here, <clears throat> we, we can, with monochromatic x-rays, we can go from about 10 to 80 keV. We can tune the monochromator. Um, we can get fields of view that are roughly one to 50 millimeters. And I showed you the intrinsic opening angle means about six millimeters in the vertical. And we can get you know, between one and 20 micron resolution, depending on the field of view. Uh, this scintillator is a lutetium aluminum garnet. And then we can put in you know, different lenses or a zoom macro lens. And right now we're using a, a fast CMOS camera. Uh, that's 1920 by 1200 pixels. And then to collect the data, you basically just rotate the sample every 180 degrees and acquire images every fixed angle. Uh, let's say 0.2 degrees. Today, we're actually gonna do 0.1 degree. And the data collection time uh, in monochromatic mode, it's typically like 10 to 30 minutes uh, to, to measure one sample. But in the pink beam mode we're using today, it's you know, typically 10 to 100 seconds. It's, it's much faster. And then once we have that data, it's sort of two to five minutes to reconstruct it. So this is what the apparatus looks like, the tomography apparatus. Um, the x-rays are coming in from the right here. That's the sample, number one. Number two is an XY translation stage that sits under the sample that's used to center the sample on the rotation axis, more or less, so that it doesn't go out of the field of view as we rotate it. This number three is the rotation stage that's used to turn the sample 180 degrees or 360 degrees, depending on the experiment. And number four here is a vertical translation stage, so we can adjust what height on the sample we're looking at. And then finally, there's a horizontal translation stage down here that moves the entire apparatus uh, left uh, into and out of the plane here, uh, which is used for getting the sample out of the way and acquiring an image with no sample. Uh, this whole thing sits on a, an optical table that has five degrees of freedom, uh, X, Y, roll, pitch, and yaw. The only degree of freedom it doesn't have is up and down the beam line this way. That's not needed. Uh, 
Then the next thing, this is a the scintillator is this little green thing. If you can see it here, greenish yellow. And, um, and then and there's a 45 degree mirror that takes the visible light and reflects it vertically. And then this is, a, a, in this case, a Nikron macro lens. Uh, that's about a one-to-one -one imager. And this is the uh, CMOS camera here with a USB 3 interface. Um, and, and then these stages, number 10, position the camera. So we've got four degrees of freedom on the camera to position it. The vertical translation is most important because that focuses the lens onto the scintillator. And, um, and then back here, number 12, um, these are uh, not involved in the tomography experiment. These are optics for the Brewan scattering experiment um, that also happens on this optical table. I want to just say a word that, um, I, um, let me go back. So this, this stage here has served us well, uh, but it has some limitations. And so we're planning to replace it. Uh, if COVID hadn't happened, this would have, it would have already been done. Um, but uh, so the existing stage has limited to about a three kilogram load. And the maximum distance that you can go from the pink beam to the top of the stage is about 75 millimeters. So basically both of these means we can't use large in situ apparatus. It's also a ball bearing stage. So it has, you know, greater, it has one to two microns of run out and wobble. So trying to do sub micron imaging with that stage is not ideal. So we have purchased this new stage and it's arrived. So this is a, it's designed to handle a 25 kilogram load with sub micron run out. So it's got a hexapod base here with six degrees of freedom and an air bearing rotation stage um, on top. Um, unfortunately, this is going to, this is even taller than the stage we've got. So what we're going to do is build, is, is make a hole in this table and, and have this stage mounted down below so that we can get sufficient clearance um, between the top of the stage and the x-ray beam to be able to have a tall apparatus in there. Okay, uh, on to tomography. So what's the basic principle of tomography? It's reconstruction from projections. So <clears throat> if you imagine a beam of x-rays here going through the sample and going through, uh, um, let's call it, you know, voxels as it goes through the sample. Um, as the beam goes through, uh, it's attenuated by, you know, Beer's law that you're all familiar with, you know, I over I zero is equal to the exponential of minus mu, where mu is the linear x-ray attenuation coefficient, and x is um, the, the uh, path length through the sample. So what happens as the beam goes through the sample here is you're measuring this line integral of mu of s ds um, as, the, as the beam goes through there. And what we would like to do is to figure out not the line integral, but the value of mu at each of these voxels. But all we've measured is basically the sum or the line integral through all the voxels on that ray path. Um, so the solution to that problem uh, is not at all obvious, um, but it, the solution is that if you measure the rays going in all different directions, um, that, that all go through this same voxel here, say, um, there is sufficient information there to reconstruct what mu of that particular voxel is. As I say, it's, it's not obvious um, that, that it's possible to do that. Um, and uh, it, a, a Nobel Prize was awarded for showing that you could. So there are different setups for doing tomography. The simplest um, is what's called pencil beam or first generation. You just make a beam that's one voxel wide and tall and shine it through the sample, measure its intensity with a position insensitive detector, you know, just a point detector. And, and then you translate the sample through the beam, measure all the 
um, the, the rays in, at that angle, um, you know, NX translations, then you rotate a little bit and do it again and rotate and do it again. And you, you basically have to do N squared measurements um, or NX times N projections measurements to reconstruct one slice. The next thing is if you have a, a one, di a, 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 a one dimensional detector here, you could do it with a fan beam. So you do all those pixels at once. Uh, but if you've got a two dimensional detector, which is what we now have, um, <clears throat> you can do the measurement like this. So you basically passing all of these rays through the sample at once. And if this is a, you know, a 1K by 1K detector, you're making a million measurements of the transmitted intensity or the line integrals at once. And all you have to do is rotate the sample and collect N projections. And cone beam is basically the same thing. This is a synchrotron where to a very good approximation, we have a parallel beam. Um, with a laboratory source, you have a point source that's very close to your sample instead of 60 meters away. Um, so it's, it's an angular beam that's called cone beam. But uh, today we're gonna be doing this parallel beam. So what are the requirements for doing tomography? Um, the first set of requirements, it comes from sampling theory. Um, so the question is, how many projections do you have to measure in order to accurately reconstruct what the attenuation coefficient at every voxel is? Uh, and the answer is the number of projections is equal to pi over two times the number of pixels in your detector in the direction perpendicular to the rotation axis, which in our case is the horizontal direction. So the number of horizontal pixels times pi over two. So our detector has 1920 pixels. So the number of projections should be at least 3016. That criteria comes from sampling theory, although you can derive it very easily if you just consider if you have a feature, if you have a sample that whose diameter is the diameter of, is the size of your detector, and you consider a, one little point on the edge of that sample, then when you rotate the sample by delta theta that's given by this theorem, that object will translate by one pixel in one angle step across your detector. However, in practice, you can get good reconstructions with fewer projections. And, and, and often that's the case, um, basically to save time. Um, so today we're gonna do 1800 projections. Um, and so we're gonna be undersampling uh, by about 50%. We could do 3,600 projections. It just takes a little longer and it makes the data set bigger. Um, and, <clears throat> um, but increasing the number of projections helps um, not only just because of the sampling theory, but just by simple signal to noise argument. Because if you collect more, um, more x-rays, you get better, you lower your statistical noise. Another requirement for tomography is completeness. So um, you, you, you must have a uniform material outside of the object at all angles. In our case, that's usually air. Um, but it wouldn't have to be. If you, if you were imaging an object that was embedded in a uniform cylinder of epoxy, um, epoxy could be that material that you're referencing to rather than air. Um, and, and so this means the sample should com remain completely in the field of view as you rotate. However, we often don't want to do that. And you can do what's called local tomography. So where this is not true and your field of view is smaller than the sample and parts of the sample are, are going in and out of the field of view as you rotate it. Um, if you do that, um, you, First of all, the absolute linear attenuation coefficient you measure will be wrong. But often we don't care what the absolute linear attenuation coefficient is. We just want to see features, right? And so uh, it, it also, depending on how inhomogeneous your sample is on the things that are going in and out of the field of view, you get artifacts in the image. But often, you know, 
you can see past those artifacts and you can get useful information um, to answer the scientific question, even though it's not a perfect image. So this is not a, a rigorous requirement. It's just what you need to do to get correct tomography data. And you must collect a full 180 degree data set. Uh, you know, doing, uh, where if you only have limited views, um, you will get artifacts. So some, but sometimes that's, it's not possible. Say in a diamond anvil cell, there's something that's holding the diamonds and uh, together. And, and so there's gonna be some post or something that gets in the way and you can't image all 180 degrees. Um, and that will lead to artifacts, but there are iterative reconstruction techniques that can minimize these artifacts, particularly using some a priori knowledge. Um, you know, if you know something about the sample that can be used to feed into the reconstruction and uh, reduce those artifacts. Okay, a, a thing that people often, you know, everybody needs to know is how big can my sample be and or what energy x-rays do I need? So this is a plot of the one over E absorption depth, which is, you know, where about 60% of the beam is absorbed um, as a function of energy from zero to 60 keV for four minerals. So the, the black line here is quartz. So you see at 20 keV, the one over E depth for quartz is a little bit over a millimeter. At and, and at 50 keV, it's a centimeter. Calcite is more absorbing. So at 20 keV, it's, um, you know, say 700, 600 microns. Magnetite, you know, iron oxide, much more absorbing. So at 20 keV, the one over E absorption depth is less than 100 microns. And calcocyte, uh, iron sulfide, even more absorbing. So if your sample is quartz, um, you, you're going to need, and, and you want to image a sample that's six millimeters, you're going to be needing to be, you know, for, for to get one over E absorption, somewhere around 30 keV. Um, if it's uh, magnetite and you had a sample that, that was that big, you would have to be, you know, over 60 keV to get the beam through it. So twice the one over E absorption depth is about the optimum uh, amount of absorption, somewhere between one over E and two and one over two E. And absorption varies linearly, oops, sorry, um, with the density of your sample, strongly non-linearly with atomic number, something like Z to the cube, and strongly non-linearly with X-ray energy, something like E cubed. So at 30 keV, I just said this, you know, one over E is about five millimeters for quartz, but only 0.2 millimeters for calcocyte. If you're considering X-ray fluorescence, like copper K alpha X-ray fluorescence at eight keV, one over E depth is, is only a hundred microns for quartz. So if you wanted to do fluorescence tomography, looking at the fluorescence of a piece of copper coming out of quartz, it's not gonna make it through even half a millimeter of quartz. And remember, it's the maximum absorption along any ray that matters, not the average absorption. So if you had two calcocyte crystals in the same slice, they will line up at some angle, and that may cause the absorption to be too large, which would lead to streak artifacts. So you got to pick your x-ray energy and sample size carefully. So this is um, showing what we do with monochromatic beam with differential absorption tomography. So this is, um, this is a plot of the absorption as a function of energy for water, which is very not very absorbing. So at 33 keV, it's here. Um, quartz is the black line. So it's significantly more absorbing than water. And then the green line is water with one mole percent potassium iodide. So you see its, its absorption comes down and then all of a sudden at the iodine absorption edge, it sharply increases, the attenuation coefficient does. And similarly with cesium chloride, 
there's this sharp jump at the cesium edge. So you can see that at this energy, cesium chloride is solution is less absorbing than quartz. And at this energy, it's more absorbing than quartz. So we can use that to very good effect. So here's an experiment where there's a glass bead column that has an aqueous phase containing cesium and an organic liquid containing iodine. So here's an image at 32.5 keV where we're below both the iodine and cesium absorption edges. And you see the, the, and it, the glass beads, bright here means absorbing and dark is unabsorbing. So like, the, and, and the, the beads are absorbing and both liquids are not absorbing. And it's really hard to tell which liquid is which. Oil and water have very similar absorption. But now we go to 33.2 keV. So we're above the iodine edge. So the organic phase is now absorbing, but we're still below the cesium edge. And if we subtract this image from this image, we get this image um, showing where the organic liquid is. If we now go above both absorption edges, so we're at 36 keV above both iodine and cesium edges, and then we subtract this image from this image, we get this image, and that shows you where the aqueous phase in the sample is. And distinguishing this aqueous phase and this organic phase when we didn't do the differential absorption tomography would be very difficult. Okay, um, we kind of already went through this on the beam line about the mirror. So this is um, you know, how the pink beam uh, works. We got the bending magnets and slits, a filter to get rid of the low energy photons. The beam bounces off this vertical mirror, another set of slits, our sample and detector. And because this mirror is bouncing the beam down, oh, the other thing I forgot to put on my requirements slide, darn it, um, is the beam needs to be perpendicular to the rotation axis. Um, in the in the beam propagation direction, and so so this beam is now not horizontal. It's bounced down off the mirror, so it's coming down at you know a, a little a fraction of a degree. So this entire lift table in the hutch can be tilted to be at the right angle, which I haven't my graphic isn't quite right, uh, but so so that this is coming down at the correct angle, um, so that it's perpendicular to the rotation axis. For triggering our camera, um, it's done in, in a hardware way so that as the rotation stage moves, the stepper motor pulses are divided by N and they trigger the camera. So we're, we don't stop during this tomography measurement. The rotation stage is continuously moving, which is much faster than a start-stop data acquisition, uh, but we know precisely what angle we're at when the camera is triggered because those triggers are coming from the rotation stage hardware. So here's an example of monochromatic versus uh, pink beam. So this is a monochromatic beam measurement. So this is the flat field measurement. That flat field is the, the, the image with no sample. And you see it's quite uniform, um, but it is falling off in intensity at the top and the bottom. That's because the synchrotron opening angle, you know, we're getting near the full width half max here. You also have these gray areas those are little scratches on the monochromator or defects in the monochromator, but we normalize every image to the flat field. So that should all correct out. And then this is a reconstructed horizontal slice and vertical slice. And you nicely see this cesium as being more absorbing than these glass beads because we're at above the cesium absorption edge with monochromatic V. But this, this experiment uh, was 900 projections with a one second exposure time. So it took 15 minutes to make, you know, to measure this full volume. Um, this is what pink beam uh, from a mirror at two and a half milliradians with a two millimeter aluminum looks like. So you see this, and this is the cesium absorption edge. So most of the photons in this red area, this red beam, are below the cesium absorption edge. 
This is what the flat field looks like. And you see these very pronounced horizontal stripes. Those come from the fact that the mirror is not perfectly flat. Um, and so we're getting artifacts, we're getting focusing in the, in the regions that the mirror is concave and defocusing in the regions where it's convex. This mirror is, you know, was an $80,000 mirror. It was the best they could do for flatness um, 20 years ago. Tw today we could get a better mirror, but as long as this structure is stable in time, and it is quite stable in time, again, this normalizes out. So this is now a reconstruction um, of that same sample um, where you can now see that, the, that the, the fluid in the pores here, there are air bubbles, that's the really dark, but the cesium chloride solution is this medium dark that is less absorbing than the glass beads because the spectrum of the pink beam, most of the photons are below the cesium edge. We now go to 1.6 milliradians on the mirror and a four millimeter aluminum absorber. Now a significant number of the photons are above the cesium edge. And now the fluid is more absorbing than the glass beads. And this experiment, instead of taking 15 minutes, took 13.6 seconds. And then finally, if we go to 0.8 milliradian mirror, you see that back here, there was still an energy cutoff at around 55, 52 keV. Um, if we go to 0.8 milliradians, um, actually we haven't hit the mirror cutoff. This, is due, this little glitch here is due to the platinum absorption edge um, at about 78 keV. Um, but the mirror is reflecting out over 100 keV. The flat field looks like this. And, and again, the, the, of course, the cesium solution is more absorbing than the glass beads. This is an, a, an application where I just did a test of a sample. This is a cement that's got some iodine dopant in it. This is a monochromatic beam experiment that took a half an hour. And this is a pink beam experiment that took 9.5 seconds. And actually my eye tells me the pink beam image is better than the monochromatic beam image. So we can get very good images with the pink beam very quickly. So the idea, the, the main reason that we started doing the pink beam was to do some slow time resolved experiments. So this is one where um, basically they were watching drainage of a, um, uh, of a granular media. So there's an iodine solution here, the black is air, and they're just letting this drain and collecting data sets every 60 seconds for 30 minutes. And you can see this is one 30 minutes later, and this black pore here has grown to be this big. And then they were able to do 3D modeling of this. I'm gonna say a little bit about a few other kinds of, of well, Tomography, the first is phase contrast, and, and we may actually do a phase contrast experiment today. Um, phase contrast takes advantage of the fact that we've been modeling the, the interaction of the x-rays with matter as a pure absorption phenomenon, but in fact, x-rays can be refracted as well as absorbed. And as an incident x-ray comes to the boundary between, let's say, a solid here and air here, it's, it's bent slightly just as visible light would be, um, you know, going, hitting a lens. X-rays are the opposite of visible light. They are actually bent, um, you know, with visible light, this would be bent into the glass. With X-rays, it's bent away from the glass. And, but the, and the angle of refraction with X-rays is very small. Um, but if you put your scintillator far enough away from the sample, that angle translates into a significant distance, you know, that's more than a pixel, and you can see it. Um, and, and the nice thing is this phase refraction effect is strong even for materials with very similar absorptions. So you have two materials next to each other that you can't tell them apart with absorption, you can often see it with phase contrast. So here's an example of rhyolite glass inclusions in a quartz grain. And this is a measurement with the scintillator to sample distance, 30 millimeters, 100 millimeters, 
150 millimeters, 200 millimeters. And I think if you look at this 200 millimeter image, you can see that there's something that looks darker inside where this green line is, surrounded by a bright rim. And in, whereas in the, in, the, in the measurement at 30 millimeters, which is more or less a pure absorption image, we can hardly see that glass inclusion. And also notice that the entire sample has a bright rim around it. And, and so does the inclusion. So this, this experiment was trying to quantify the size and shape of these melt inclusions. And the phase contrast was critical for being able to do that. These plots are the line profiles along that green line. And you see in the, in the 200 millimeter one, this is the bright rim and then there's a dark rim inside that. Basically, the x-rays are conserved. It's just that the x-rays that should have gone straight through here um, are missing because a lot of them got bent out of the image. So the bright rim is the ones that where they were bent out into the air or into the uh, crystal in this case. And the dark rim, uh, this dark uh, area here, is where those photons are missing from. So that's phase contrast. Say uh, things about a couple of other tomography modalities that we do at Jesse Cars. Um, these are both first gen, the, the, the advantage of absorption tomography is that we're making, a, you know, in the case of the detector we're using today, we're making 2.3 million measurements at once. Um, because we're, you know, we have detect two dimensional detectors that can detect the spatial distribution of the photons of interest. When we're doing X-ray diffraction, um, we have no position information on where the, the beam originated from in the sample. The diffraction detector is just telling us what angle it's scattered at. So we have to go back to that first generation pencil beam tomography. We just have one X-ray beam, a micron in size or a couple microns, and we scan the sample through it. We rotate, scan and rotate, and at each point, we collect a diffraction pattern. And so the, the diffraction signal can be constructed, reconstructed tomographically. As I said, it requires first generation tomography. Um, and so we're going to select a single peak in the powder pattern and, and reconstruct it. It does require that the grain size be less than the voxel size, so that at each voxel, you're actually getting good powder diffraction statistics. And your grains should preferably not have a strong preferred orientation. And uh, yeah, so this is the diffraction pattern of a meteorite, the uh, Murchison meteorite. Um, and there are three phases here, the Kronstadite, Toclinite, and Forsterite. And so they've selected you know, the strongest diffraction peak for each of those phases from the diffraction pattern, and then made a sinogram uh, of that. And I'll explain what is, basically this is um, uh, the position uh, uh, as a function of angle. And that's what can be reconstructed. And so this is a reconstruction of the absorption, which was just measured with a transmission uh, intensity detector. And then this is a reconstruction of where those different phases were, not based on their absorption, but based on their diffraction peak. Another first generation technique is fluorescence tomography. So again, you put a pencil beam through the sample, but instead of measuring the diffraction, you measure the fluorescence, typically here at 90 degrees. Again, this detector has no position information saying where the photons came from. So we have to do that first generation technique. Um, but this is what you can do. Um, so this is now a reconstruction through an Aerodopsis seed showing the location of iron, manganese, and zinc. Um, you know, these beautiful patterns. Um, so this is, you know, scanning the sample 360 degrees. Uh, the whole thing took about one and a half hours um, to make one slice through the sample. But in cases where you can't slice your sample and do, and this doesn't really take more time than an X-ray fluorescence two-dimensional map. Um, and it has the advantage that you're intrinsically getting a one micron thick section, whereas making a physical section of this sample and then doing a 2D normal XRF map might be difficult to make a section that thin. 
And finally, one thing that we have at Jesse Cars that I'm going to show you is the ability to do high pressure tomography. So this is the instrumentation for that. So we have this um, uh, a 250 ton press with uh, two rotation uh, drives that can rotate while under a high load um, in the press. So we can take a sample to high pressure and do tomography on it. So schematically shown like this. So it's, it's the same way we're going to be doing tomography, except that the thing is inside this massive device. Um, and this is the kind of, that one of the reasons this was done was to be able to measure the volume of amorphous materials at high pressure. Measuring the volume of crystalline materials at high pressure is easy because you can do Bragg diffraction and measure the lattice spacing. But for amorphous materials, you can't. So one way is to just directly measure the volume as you squeeze it. So this is vitreous forsterite and, and showing how the volume measured with these reconstructed spheres here varies as a function of the pressure it, that the sample is undergoing. So the slope of that line is telling us the compressibility of this material. And this is an example. We can also take those two rotations and instead of turning them together to do tomography, turn them in the opposite direction to do shear strain, um, shear the sample, and then rotate and do tomography. So we can image as we do progressive shear on a sample. One of the things that we're planning to do in that big, that new sample stage I showed you was to build a device to be able to do more shallow crustal conditions um, in a triaxial uh, device that can go to, you know, three to five kilometer uh, depths and where we can do both a confining pressure and an axial force and fluid flow all at the same time. Okay. I'm uh, just about finishing up. I just want to show you what some of the screens are that we use to control the devices on the beam line. We aren't going to be using the monochromator today because we're in peak beam mode. And because I rotated to zero angle, it says we're at essentially infinite energy. Um, but this is the screen we would use to control the monochromator in monochromatic mode. These are the controls for the three slits coming down the beam line. The first set of slits is very uh, far upstream a vertical slit in the near the mirror and a final slit just upstream of the sample. Um, this is the screen to control the mirror. So right now, the when this screenshot was taken, the pitch of the mirror um, is 1.5 milliradians, but we can easily change it here. Um, and we've got the mirror bent uh, to a negative curvature Mean and uh, meaning that it's it's not focusing the beam, it's defocusing the beam. In fact, we hit the limit switch, so we can't go any, we're, we're defocusing as much as we can. This is that five axis optical table, and we tilt, um, AX is the angle that we tilt to follow the, the angle of the beam off the mirror. And this is the filters that are up near that very first set of slits. And right now there's a filter in that's a, a millimeter of aluminum and a quarter millimeter of copper, but we can select, you know, two, four millimeters of aluminum or a half millimeter or a millimeter of copper to control how much, how much of the low energy photons we remove. Getting more to what the user sees, this is the sample stage that's used to position the sample. This is the rotation axis, omega. Um, this is the height of the sample, this vertical Z. The Tomo X and Tomo Y are the stages that are on top of the rotation axis to center the sample on the rotation stage. Uh, and this is the, the stage, the sample X moves the entire apparatus out of the beam. Um, this is, these are the stages that are used to move the camera. Uh, y is the focus adjustment. And uh, again, oh, that was the same. I already showed that five, ox, five axis uh, table. Finally, the, the real business end. This is the, 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 the screen to control the demography data collection. So we tell it what angle we want to start, how many angles, the step size, and um, we tell it what position of that sample X motor is the in the beam position and what's the out of the beam position. Um, we tell it when we want to collect the flat fields, 
Um, and then where we want to save the data, the file name, and the exposure time, and then a, a button to start the scan. So this is underneath this, there's a Python program that's controlling the data acquisition. It collects the dark fields, the flat fields, and the projections. It saves the data in a portable binary format called HDF5. Um, and this entire screen is controlled, or the, the entire Python program, I should say, is controlled by EPIC's process variables. And don't worry about what that is if you don't know. But it means that everything can be controlled and scripted by any client on the network. So any client could um, change something on the beam line and then basically, under software control, pr effectively press this start scan button. So, it, you know, you um, here, here and then there's also a second screen where basically all the uh, or, or the metadata for your sample. So, you know, a description of your sample, the description of the optics that are in use, um, and then the user information. And there's metadata saved both from this screen as well as all the EPIX PVs or many of the EPIX PVs for the state of the storage ring and the beam line and the sample stage and all of that are written to that HDF5 file. So that's all captured. And we could add additional metadata for your specific experiment, like the temperature of your sample or whatever. And this is an EPIX scan record that could scan any Epix PV, in this case, it's scanning the vertical position of the sample, but it could also scan the monochromator energy or the sample temperature. And then at each point in the scan, it's taking a complete tomography data set. Okay. Um, I went 15 minutes over, but that's fine. Um, I think at this point would be a good time to uh, ask for any questions and um and once that's done we could take a break anybody got questions hi um i have a brief question and i yeah. might have just missed this if you're doing something that's quantitative and you use a pink beam how worried are you about like beam hardening artifacts or anything like that oh, that's a good question and, and i didn't discuss beam hardening uh, but beam hardening is, is something that can happen when you have a polychromatic beam because there is not a single well-defined linear x-ray attenuation coefficient the lower energy x-rays are more strongly absorbed than the high energy x-rays and so what you see is that uh, the transmission on the edge of the sample is relatively high compared to the center, uh, compared to what you would see with a monochromatic beam. In, in, so that's why we have the filters that we can adjust the, the, the width of that, you know, that bandwidth that we're putting on the sample. And um, to be honest, I have not really seen strong beam hardening artifacts um, in the data that we've been collecting. Um, but, but it's certainly something to be, to look out for, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And, and I should say that, you know, people, I, I do not have any beam hardening software correction um, uh, running on our processing, but certainly people who have laboratory sources do have that. And there is code in the public domain for doing beam hardening corrections. And, you know, we could make some measurements on, you know, known, shaped materials in order to calibrate that. Good question. Hey, Mark, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, so I was a little late to the session. You probably already covered this, but I've always been under the impression that a radial accelerating charge doesn't emit any energy. So I'm just curious, like, what I missed in undergrad physics and where the energy is coming from for these photons. It, oh. Well, as an electro, as a charged particle is is accelerated in a magnet, it does emit radiation, right? It and, and you know that's what, for instance, if you if you hit an electron beam into a piece of copper, uh, which is what an X-ray tube is, mm -hmm. it emits bremsstrahlung radiation, right? Which is the German word that means breaking radiation. So, and that's because that electron beam is being decelerated in the, yeah. in the sample. So and all that kinetic energy gets turned into the photon. 
Exactly. And so it, at the APS, um, a, a, a fraction of the B energy in every electron is lost on each orbit. And that, okay. and that energy has to be made up with, uh, made up for with a radio frequency cavity um, uh, in one part of the storage ring. So as the electrons go through this radi radio frequency cavity, they get a kick that accelerate, that, that, that puts them back to the correct energy of the machine. And, they, and it's a stochastic process. So some electrons lost a lot of energy because they gave off a high energy photon and some might not have given off any photons. And so the radio frequency cavity um, has, has, is designed such that the, the, the ones that lost the most energy get the biggest kick and to, to, try, to keep them all okay. you know, at, the, at the proper energy. Yeah. Okay. That that answers my question completely. Thanks. Okay. Sure. I was missing something. Uh, Mark, this is yeah. you. Um, I have a question. Um, I know in most cases the absolute linear attenuation coefficient is not needed. People just want to see the features. Correct. Um, my question is: is is it possible to measure? the absolute linear attenuation coefficient use, using the, the, the thermography method? Oh, yes. I mean, when we do the monochromatic beam measurement, the, the, the data I send you home with is the absolute linear attenuation coefficient um, in units of inverse pixel size. So, you know, usually linear attenuation coefficient is in units of, say, inverse centimeters. Uh, but in this case, it's in inverse pixel size. So if your pixel size is 10 microns, it's the linear attenuation coefficient per 10 microns. But you just multiply by 100 uh, or by 1,000 and you get per centimeter. And, and yeah, those, and those are quite accurate. Um, but with, as the earlier question, you know, with the pink beam, they're, they're not as meaningful. Um, if, you're, if you really care about it, uh, you know, the, the absolute value, you should probably, you know, measure some standards as well to, as a check and possibly as a calibration. Although in principle, you should not need to calibrate. All right, thank you. Mark, it's uh, Doug. I just got uh, one question. And when you were showing the phase contrast image uh, reconstruction, yeah. Right, uh, uh, was there was kind of a bunch of concentric circles. Is that more an instrumental artifact, or was that some scattering of something within the sample, or in, um, that came no, back the, in the reconstruction? It, uh, one of the major artifacts in tomography, and we're going to see this this afternoon, is what are called ring artifacts, and they you know, they come about because if you imagine that one pixel on your detector is misbehaving um uh you know it, it's it's not it's not giving the correct response then that will that will reconstruct as a ring because imagine a cylinder basically projects as one uh into one pixel or, or the edge of the cylinder projects into one pixel on your detector and so when we if if we do our flat field normalization and you know, it turns out that the response of that pixel to the to the flat field is different than its response when it's only seeing 10% of as many photons. In other words, it's not having a linear response. Then you get a ring artifact, and they can be quite pronounced. And um, they're sort of the bane of tomography. And uh, we've got some software that's implemented in our standard reconstruction, and we're going to demonstrate that this afternoon to minimize those rings, but there's always a trade-off uh, because, you know, sometimes your sample really has a ring in it and then it gets rid of it. <laughs> so it's, uh, yeah, but, but I'll show you this afternoon when we do the reconstruction, how we can, how we can make it a little bit better. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Any more questions? Um, hi. 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 I have a, a quick question. I am not like an experienced user in the beamline or anything. 
but I'm thinking about trying to image fluid inclusions in magnetite grains. In that case, would it be better to try phase contrast or uh, fluorescence? Actually, fluid inclusions in magnetite should be a dead easy problem because there's a there there's an enormous absorption contrast between the iron oxide and I mean I'm assuming this is an, an a saline fluid or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, it, there's going to be a huge absorption contrast. So absorption contrast should see them no problem. The 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 biggest problem is that magnet as I showed in the one of those early slides, magnetite is very absorbing. So there's going to be a limit on how big of a sample you can look at. Um, you know, so but but if it's just a few you know a few millimeters, we can get beam through that, and we should be able to see the fluid inclusions fine. Okay. And those would be just like, let's say like natural grains that are like that big, or can they be like polished grains on a thin section? Um, that's a really good question. One of the things I didn't talk about in the requirements also is that um, for tomography, you ideally you'd like a sample that in the in the direction um, perpen, uh, the direction parallel to the beam. Uh, it doesn't matter what the height is, but in the X, Y direction, um, in plane direction of the beam, it's best to have a sample that's more or less equant, you know, a cylinder or a square. What's really bad is something that's that's a plane, that's a that's a wafer in, in that direction, because, um, it, you know, in, in one orientation, it's very thin. And in the other orientation, it's very thick. Um, and um, so a thin section is not a good thing to use for tomography because you know you, you, you would have a hard time imaging it parallel to the glass slide. Um, you know, this, the thing would only be 30 microns thick. Um, so yes, freestanding grains or drill cores or something like that um, would be best. Okay, thank you. Yeah, sure. I mean, in magnetite, I mean, you can crush the rock um, you know, that then you, you know, it's pretty easy to separate out the magnetite and then, and then mount them. And so we have yeah, a lot like, of like, yeah, I mean, I've been doing a lot of studies recently, for example, on diamonds, um, which mm -hmm. are freestanding diamonds, and they're interested in, in the inclusions in the diamonds, you know, silicates and oxides. And there we just glue them to the end of a glass fiber. Oh, okay. Or, but you can glue them to the end of a toothpick. I mean, it doesn't matter. Just something that we, we can uh, hold in our sample holder. Okay. Thank you very much. Sounds good. Anyone else? Are we ready for a Mark, break? Mark, yeah. I see a, some, someone, um, Mary, uh, there's a one uh, person raised hand. Oh, disappeared. Disappeared. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Alrighty. Let's take a break and, and meet again at 30. We'll take about a 10 minute break, nine minute break, meet at like 35 after uh, the hour. And we're going to be back. I'm going to be at that point, I'll be out at the beam line and we'll um, uh, show you the hutch and then we'll mount a sample and measure it. See you then. Okay, so we are now um, out at the beam line, um, and this is the control area for the 13 BMD station. So normally, if you were here doing an experiment, uh, you'd be sitting here uh, controlling the experiment on these couple of monitors here, controlling the beam line on these couple of monitors here. And then when you're, uh, when you're done collecting a data set, you scoot over to this machine, which is used for doing the reconstructions. Uh, today, we're not going to physically sit at these machines for doing it, but I've got um, a, a VNC session running on my computer in my office for both of these computers so that we can see the same screens we would be seeing if uh, we were out here at the beam line. <clears throat> so now I'm going to walk up into the experimental station.
This is the 13 BMD station. Um, and it's it's got uh, three, as I said, three experiments run in here. Right now we're doing the computed microtomography. At around the same location on this optical table, um, th there are diamond anvil cell experiments with Brewan uh, spectroscopy. The uh, Brewan system is up above on an upper level here of this uh, optical table. It has a, a, a laser and a Fabry-Perot interferometer. Then these optics back here are what bring the laser beam down to the sample. Uh, but today we're doing tomography. And uh, so what we see here is the end of the beam line. So this is the that final set of slits that I showed in my uh, diagrams earlier. Um, and everything from this point upstream is ultra high vacuum in the beam line. Um, this is a beryllium window that separates the ultra high vacuum uh, component of the beam line. We have here a roughing vacuum uh, terminated by an aluminum window um, where the beam comes out. If we were in monochromatic beam, this would be a, a Kapton or a plastic window, and we'd have an ion chamber mounted here to measure the intensity of the monochromatic beam, and we feed back on that for stabilization purposes. Uh, but we don't need that with the pink beam. Uh, this is the five-axis optical table that I was talking about. It's currently in its lowest position. Um, and the, the X-ray beam comes out this aluminum window, goes through the air here for a half a meter or so, <clears throat> and then this is where the sample's mounted. Uh, we, we often use drill chucks to um, mount the sample um, because they're convenient, um, but they screw into this base plate here, and, and you, if, if you have your own apparatus, we can accommodate that as long as it's built so that we you know, have a way to adapt it to this mounting plate. And uh, like yesterday, I had an in, an in situ testing apparatus, a uniaxial force apparatus that was mounted on here um, doing some experiments. So this is the sample stage that you saw previously, horizontal stage to move the sample in and out of the beam, vertical translation stage. This has 30 millimeters of travel what we've got here are some slip rings so that the rotate the, the stages above the rotation stage don't need to have their cables dragging around as we rotate. So the, the, the motor control, the motor signals <clears throat> for those translation stages go through a slip ring system here through the rotation stage. So slip ring, rotation stage, slip ring, and then the two translation stages that are on top of the rotation axis that are used to control, to center the sample on the rotation axis. Then uh, maybe Tim can swing around. This is the scintillator um, that it converts the visible light to x-rays. I discovered yesterday that uh, it had some dirt on it from a previous experiment. So I've tilted like, a little bit to get the dirty part out of the field of view. Um, that's why it looks kind of cockeyed. Um, and then this is a 45-degree uh, a mirror. This is a, a Nikon macro lens. That's a one-to-one -one imager. And this is the CMOS camera with a USB 3 connection. That camera is connected to uh, XYZ stage and also a rotation to position it um, in the beam. And then that entire camera tower here is on a translation stage that goes down the beam line away from the sample. So that's how we do phase contrast, is we just increase this distance. Um, right now, it's about 40 millimeters from the sample to the scintillator. Um, but uh, we could increase that to a couple of hundred millimeters to increase the phase contrast. What else I want to tell you about here? 
Let's go down and look at the um, 250 ton press. So this is the, the 250 ton press where we could do the high pressure tomography. Uh, see these two rotation motors driving these uh, plates here. Um, and what goes inside that is a sample assembly. This is the one that's designed for tomography, this Drickamer cell. Um, where it has an aluminum containing ring um, and, the, and the anvil, there's a 250 ton hydraulic press here can squeeze the sample um, as it's rotating. We can't go to the full 250 tons with the rotation device, um, but we can get to significantly high pressures and high temperatures. And then there's another cell called the Paris Edinburgh cell here for different types of experiments that can go in the same apparatus. And, and, and in this multi-anvil press, there's a, the capability of doing both imaging and x-ray diffraction. The x-ray diffraction is critical because that's how one measures what pressure you're at using some sort of a solid uh, crystalline uh, standard where you know what the lattice spacing is at a given pressure. One of the things with the tomography, of course, we're measuring visible light from the scintillator. So it has to be dark in here when we're making the measurements. So one of the things you have to remember to do is turn out all the lights when you leave the room. Um, and of course, the radiation levels in this enclosure are extremely high, particularly with pink beam. Um, so no one is allowed to be in this enclosure when the experiment's going on and there's uh, you know, a fairly elaborate safety system to ensure that. Um, and so once we are ready to turn on the beam, we'll, we'll do a search of the hutch uh, to make sure nobody else is in here. So, uh, as I said, uh, there, there are a variety of ways to mount samples here. This is the smallest drill chuck we've got. This is the largest drill chuck we have. And, um, and then th there are many people bring their own specialized apparatus that mounts directly to the stage. And that new stage that I showed you with the hexapod and the air bearing will be able to handle significantly larger and taller apparatus than this one. Um, so th the samples that we're going to be measuring today um, Doug will talk about when we get back, when I get back to my office, uh, but they're samples from the Chicxulub uh, impact uh, crater, Mexico, and from drill cores from that. And um, they're, they're uh, irregular pieces of rock, and they don't really fit very well into a drill chuck. So what we're gonna use to hold these today is just get some plasticine, uh, like modeling clay, um, and put a piece of that on the drill chuck, and then press the sample into the plasticine firmly enough that it's not going to wiggle and it's not going to fall off. So that's all, all that's involved in, and I want to get it so that it's, you know, roughly in the center of the drill chuck just to make life easy, but it's, it's not critical at all. Um, so mounted the sample. I'm now going to turn out the lights. Uh, this, this set of lights on the table um, can only be turned off from inside the hut. So we have to remember to do that before we leave. And now I'm going to go search the hutch. Tim can still be doing this. So I press this button. Searching station D. And I make sure that there's nobody in here. Searching Nobody sleeping on the floor. Searching Press the second button, which ensures that I've looked in this end of the station as well. And then we're going to both leave. Right, and I'm going to go over here 
and turn out the light, the room light, and close the door. The button is a dead man. I have to keep my finger on it. And there's a, a warning tone telling everybody to get out of there, and they have about 60 seconds to exit uh, or hit the emergency stop button if anybody were caught in there. Oh. Are these hooked up to the VNC? Do we still need the camera? Uh, well, I wanted to show oh, them okay. these. So what we've got uh, up above, and I should have pointed out, is that there is a, just a regular camera on the table that's looking at the scintillator and the sample. And you can see with this pink beam how brightly that scintillator is glowing. I'm not sure if you can see that there's snow uh, little dots coming and going all over this monitor. Those are scattered x-rays that are directly hitting that uh, camera. And then there's another uh, one that's a little further away that's sort of seeing the same thing. So you see, that you can't really tell here that the scintillator, where the beam is on the scintillator, it's just glowing so brightly. If I were to close here uh, the slits in the hutch to just a hundred microns. And, and then watch the scintillator. Now you can see where the beam actually is vertically and horizontally. Right now it's only a hundred microns, um, but it, when I open it up, it's, it's 11.2 millimeters wide. That's a 25 millimeter round scintillator. And what you're seeing on this monitor, which we'll see with VNC in my office, but that's the shadow of that sample. So on the left is the is the air and on the right is the sample. And it's sample MM501. You got to remember that. Okay. Okay. So I think we're, uh, you know, the beam is on now. So we're done out here. And I'm going to go back to my office and let uh, Doug tell you a bit about these samples. And then we'll look at measuring them. OK, I am uh, back in my office. And I'm going to uh, put up the uh, PowerPoint for Doug. And he can tell you about it. Okay, thank you, Mark. <laughs> okay, we good? We're good. Sure, okay. Thanks, Mark, and I really appreciate uh, this, right? We just kind of, I contacted Mark because I was interested in um, the tomography, and uh, this turned out to be a really good opportunity to uh, test it. And so, well, I'll just give you a short talk about what we're we're doing, and um, uh, you could actually advance uh, the slide there. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. and, uh, oops. And um, uh, so, uh, and uh, uh, my grad student, uh, I'm at Purdue. I've moved here recently, but my grad student's at Alberta, and he's online here today too, uh, Chris. And uh, uh, we're working on these uh, samples to study them. and But basically, we're looking at impact structures, and I've worked on a number of impact structures, a geophysicist and a rock physicist, mostly. And, uh, uh, you know, is, uh, reasons we want to look at them is just basic knowledge to understand how they're made and, and resources. And, uh, you know, there's even getting to the point now, and we're putting a proposal to go do seismic work over some other uh, 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 structures, right? Just to uh, understand uh, if you're going to be, if if people are actually going to have boots on the ground on Mars or Moon, right? You, you and you want to develop habitable structures. Uh, we probably want to understand what the physical properties of materials are because we'll be using geophysics to to look ahead uh, and uh, developing those things. And these are really damaged materials. That's what's interesting, as I'll show you. So, uh, go ahead, Mark. Yeah. And uh, 
Uh, so there's just huge amounts of, and there's, a, I, I had a bunch of animations here, I guess, <laughs> but, uh, so I'll have to get you to uh, keep continuing, but, um, so you release oh, vast yeah, amounts of energy, right? Yeah, go ahead. You can, and, okay. uh, so if projectile comes in on the left-hand side, people have probably seen this uh, figure from many places, right? Uh, uh, what actually happens, right? You. Uh, on the left, you can see that there's, uh, you know, you vaporize the projectile. Usually they're coming in at 20 kilometers or so a second. You get a lot of melt produced because of uh, uh, shock melting. And then you get a zone that's uh, shock metamorphism, yeah, uh, deforming the, the actual minerals, putting them into high pressure phases, whatever. And then outside of that, a lot of, oops, uh, a lot of fracturing and brecciation. And, um, uh, uh, so, uh, and, and on the right is just showing, you know, ranges of pressures you might get kind of in that cartoon. And, and so we uh, were, got really lucky to be involved. Uh, go ahead, Mark. Yeah. With, with uh, Chicks and Hoops, I picked, you know, as, as corny a uh, <laughs> uh, picture I could get. And, <laughs> and uh, this is actually from Alberta. It's where the uh, well, I can't call it Cretaceous tertiary anymore. I'll get in trouble, right? It's the Cretaceous paleogene boundary, and uh, you just hit it. There's an arrow. It's uh, uh, right there, okay? And you can go put your finger on it. Uh, many places in the world, right? It was discovered in Italy, and uh, you probably all heard the story about the iridium. And so uh, there was a, a project uh, in 2016. Go ahead. Mark to uh, to drill this right. There's been a lot of previous geophysical work, and uh, uh, without going into a whole course on structures, uh, it, it's 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 called a peak ring structure, which means that it's it's large enough that uh, uh, instead it's a complex crater, but it's large enough that instead of having sort of a central mountain range, you get a ring of almost mountains around it. And uh, you can see in this seismic uh, image, there's the, the peak rings on, on two sides there of it, through one of it. And uh, go ahead, Mark. Yeah. And just what kind of the structure is inferred to uh, look like, right? Going down, uh, deforming uh, even the moho and with the central uplift uh, with the peak rings at the edge of it. And there was discussion about how these actually formed. Uh, and so the, the uh, a main motivation for carrying out this drilling, go ahead. Uh, was to, uh, uh, and this is seismic actually, and so this is seismic and tomography. Uh, and uh, if you see there, the, the chicks dash 03A, that's about where the borehole was planned to be. And uh, you can see that it says KPG. That's the actual very top of uh, the surface that would have been left after the impact. And uh, the velocities beneath it there are actually um, uh, quite low. Okay, and that was in the tomography, and um, uh, that was a complication if you're trying to understand the structure because people believe that the material came from maybe 20 kilometers laterally and maybe 12 to 15 kilometers in depth and uh, came up to that point, right? And uh, so I don't show a model, but there's models of that that, that show that in a lot of detail. Uh, but go ahead. So the, the question is, uh, what was that material and, and uh, why it was slow velocity. So they had the, the drilling project, Expedition 364, and we were asked to uh, help with carrying the seismic measurements actually out in the borehole itself. And uh, so go, there's the, the platform and the drill rig is actually pretty small. You can't even see it. That's how you got onto the platform. It was called a widow maker, <laughs> right? Wow. And because uh, <laughs> you could fall off of it. <laughs> So uh, uh, they lifted the crane up, and here was from the Widowmaker looking down on on the drill rig, and that's some core Brescia, actually, and then sun setting at night. Uh, and so we weren't out on it all the time. That's okay. Go ahead, Mark. Yeah. And uh, uh, here's just a real a summary of the, the results that was in the, the Nature paper. And, uh, oh, no, actually, this is in the Physical Properties paper. But, but you see that... Uh, where the borehole is, that was the seismic data on the left. In the middle is uh, the interpreted core and with the felsic basement. So it was granite, uh, right? Pretty interesting. And so, but there's other components to that. Uh, there's uh, uh, this really damaged granite. There's going to be impact dikes and there's impact melt kind of dikes that are in there. 
Uh, on the right is uh, different measurements from the core from density. Now, granite should be about 2.65-ish uh, grams per cc for density, and the density of stuff uh, you can see is quite a bit lower, 2.3 or so, 2.2. Uh, that's because of the high levels of porosity that were induced into this material, right? That's very unusual for, for these kind of rocks. Uh, on the right is the seismic velocity measured a number of different ways. And uh, uh, the, via, the borehole seismic is the blue one, and the other one's sonic logs. And you can see that the velocity of granite, typical felsic crust, would be on the order of six kilometers a second. But if, if you look at the scale on that, it's only about four kilometers a second. So it's a huge deficit because of the damage. And so uh, uh, what we're trying to do now, uh, Chris has got some of these samples, and he's measured in a lab ultrasonic uh, velocities, but we just want to be able to to characterize uh, these samples as much as, as possible. Go ahead, uh, Mark. Yeah. And so, well, this was the air gun. This was our seismic measurement. There's Chris in the field. We can go through that and whale watching and when we're done. And this is what the data looks like. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail because most of you uh, aren't, uh, but this is a summary, which is better. And uh, so here's the velocities and different kinds of materials. Towards the top, it was sediments post-impact, uh, marls, uh, and uh, uh, down to about 600 or so. And then below about 700, we uh, say about 630 to 700, there's what's called kind of suavite. That is kind of this mix of melt and brescia and, and that. And uh, that's been wholly altered. And then beneath it, uh, you can see the granitoid that goes down beneath about 700 or so meters. And uh, that's what it looks like. It looks like granite, right? Uh, but um, if you're actually the, uh, the picture doesn't give it the full character. You know, it's, you can really see that it's been, uh, you know, highly fractured, right? And there's a scanning electron microscope of some of that granite that Chris made uh, uh, just to show you how damaged it is. And so, Part of this is just to try and understand what that cracks are looking like. Uh, so is that the last one? I think so. Uh, yeah, but there's also, there's not just this stuff. There's uh, there's these melts that are coming into it. And in the lab, it also shows to be quite low velocity. And so there has to be fairly high levels of porosity within public bubbles that we're in with that uh, melt zones. So we're excited about just seeing you know, what the structure of these are going to look like in more detail, right? So, again, it's it's just part of the characterization to help us interpret these low, really unusual low velocities in these kind of materials. So, so right. anybody has any questions, <laughs> go ahead. So. Any questions? No. <laughs> Okay, well, thanks a lot, Doug. Good, yeah. Thanks, Mark. Now, yeah. now that, that helps me understand what I'm looking at. <laughs> <laughs> looking for cracks. Yeah. Looking for cracks, okay. <laughs> cracks we're good at. <laughs> uh, no, that's not what I want. I want PNC there. So we want PNC. First one we want is point gray one. Okay. So we've now got the beam on the sample, and what what we want to do is um, is sort of figure out where we are on the sample. And so I'm going to use the uh, this tomography stage control, um, and we can see that in in this um, as it's oriented right now, which is with the I pull this so you can see the whole thing, and I don't. This one. Um, 
we're at zero degrees on rotation. And so at zero degrees, the rotation stage, I'm sorry, the translation stage that's perpendicular to the beam is the one called TOMO Y. So what I need to do is center this sample um, so that we don't have so much air on the left. And right now we don't have any air on the right. So if I, every time I click this, I'm moving the sample 50 microns. And what I wanna do is get it, you know, roughly in the center. So I got about the same amount of air on both sides. That looks pretty good. And now I'm going to rotate it 90 degrees. And, and now we're in the, so this sample is, um, it's, it's wider in one direction than the other. So now we're going through the, the thick direction of the sample. So it, it got significantly darker uh, in this projection. Um, and now I want to center that roughly. Um, and that's the, the other stage is now perpendicular to the beam, the one that's called Tomo X. Thirty-five degrees, and we can see that the sample at 135 degrees is staying in the beam. I still have a little bit of air on the right and a little bit of air on the left, and if we go all the way to 180, it stayed in the beam. Um, zero, 90. And I think you can see, I mean, it's it's a little hard to see the structure through all the stripes and so on. Um, but as it rotates, I think you can see some big, um, what appear to be big grains, like right this this bright thing here, or it's something that's that's different from the the material around it, looks more uniform. Yeah, that's and, just Mark. If I can, that's yeah. a melt. So okay. yeah, yeah. So it's probably like a crystal. Uh, I'll bet. Yeah. Yeah, this is the MM501, the melt sample. <clears throat> and, okay, so, and, and we can also move the sample up and down. I can't go much lower down. My sample stage only goes to minus five. So I don't think I can get to the very top of the sample. Um, but we could go up a lot. Um, this this sample is pretty tall compared to our field of view. So let's say a word about that. Um, the uh, this camera is 1920 by 1200 pixels. Um, it um, but but right now the beam isn't quite 1200 pixels tall um, because even though I'm defocusing with the mirror, it's not quite um, as big as that. The, I'm, right now I'm using the Nikon macro lens, which has, which with, with no tube on it and, and with the minimum focus adjustment on the lens. And at that point, it is truly a one-to-one -one imager. And the pixels in my camera, in the CMOS camera, are 5.74 microns. And the pixels in the image now are also exactly 5.74 microns. So if we calculate what our field of view is here, over. use Python as my calculator. Um, so it's, um, it's 5.74 microns times 1920 horizontal. So our field of view horizontally right now is 11.02 millimeters. And vertically, it's, um, I, I had to, so I, I set a region of interest on the camera. So I'm not reading out all 1200 vertical pixels. I'm only reading out 1020. So I threw away, you know, a little less than 20% of the pixels vertically. Um, and so, so 1020, so that says our vertical field of view is 5.85 millimeters.
<clears throat> and so that's all the sample we can see at once. If we want to measure the whole um, height of the sample, we, we would have to make, and we will make multiple measurements um, uh, to, to be able to see the whole height. The, let me just pull up the camera screen for a second. So this is the camera control screen. And um, right now the exposure time is eight milliseconds. And um, when the camera is just free running at that rate, at that exposure time, um, it's we're getting 130 frames a second, between 129 and 130 frames a second. Um, we're collecting it in 12-bit mode and converting the data to 16-bit. Um, so we're the, this camera only is a 12-bit camera. It's not a 16-bit camera. But it can go quite fast. If we run it in 8-bit mode, it can read the full frame at, um, uh, it, can, it can stream the whole frame at 163 frames a second. 12-bit mode, it's 130 frames a second. <clears throat> and you can see if I, um, I can adjust the exposure time either on that camera screen or on this tomography data collection screen. If I were to increase the exposure time here to say um, 0 0.00, wait, that's, that's funny, that's, Um, if I went to eight milliseconds, actually it was six milliseconds. I don't know why that hadn't updated. Um, we get to the point where we, our camera is, is overexposed. So this bright stripe that where my cursor is right now, uh, this, is an, this is an image J viewer. It says it's very close to 64K, 65.565. This one is 65. 565, so it's it's saturated. So you can't, you have to set your exposure time such that you don't saturate in the flat fields. So that's what I've done now. And um, do if there's anything else I want to show you. Let me just show you a little bit of something about the mirror. Um, well, I could show you first the camera stage. So um, I've adjusted the camera so that I think the rotation axis is close to the center of the field of view. And uh, because the, remember there's, there's a rotation axis below this sample, which has an, Amer that's an imaginary line in space. And it projects onto this detector at some pixel horizontally. And when we line this thing up, we like to put the rotation axis close to the center of the camera. It doesn't have to be exact, and it's something we refine during the reconstruction. Um, the, but one thing, and, and I position the camera in, to be in horizontally to line that up. Um, vertically, if I move the camera, uh, each when I click here, it's going to move the camera 100 microns away from the scintillator. And if I do that a few times, you see that the sample is very blurry. So we've, we've moved it out of focus. And what I want to do is, in fact, I can even blow this up. Uh, zoom in on that image as I focus the camera. That looks quite sharp. Looks like right there I went through it. So now the, the camera is focused. <clears throat> and you don't have to do that when you change samples. We only have to do that when we change the optics because remember the camera is focused on the scintillator, not on the sample. Um, let me open here.
So if I change here the pitch of the mirror, which right now is, is 1.5 milliradians, if I increase that to 1.6, it's going to bounce the beam down a little more. And you see it moved the entire location of the beam um, by probably about a millimeter. Now it's back. And I could also, if, if I were trying to focus this X-ray beam, I could change the curvature of the mirror here. Um, and the curvature bends both ends of the mirror symmetrically. And then ellipticity bends one end positive and one end negative. And we need to make this mirror somewhat elliptical, not spherically bent, but elliptically bent in order to best focus the beam in this station. And for the diamond anvil cell experiments that we do in this station, we, we take this beam, which right now is, we just said, five, over five millimeters tall, and we can focus all of those x-rays down into something that's under 20 microns in the vertical direction. So we're increasing the flux per unit area by factors of many hundred. But right now, the mirror is all set up. So I don't need to really worry about that. Um, I think we're, we're close to being ready to collect a tomography data set here. Um, so I'm going to, this is the tomography data collection uh, window. So I've said I want to go from zero degrees and collect 1,800 projections um, with an angle step of 0.1 degree which means we're, we're gonna stop at 180 minus delta or 170.9 degrees. Um, you know, if I change this to, um, to 0.2, we would then collect 360 um, degrees because we got 1800 projections. So we can collect 360 or we can collect 180. Um, we, we, should, we need to collect at least 180. Um, and here we set the sample out position. So the sample out position is 20 millimeters. That's sufficient horizontally. That's sufficient to get the sample completely out of the field of view. And let, in fact, let's try that. So if I push move sample out, the sample's now out of the field of view, and we're seeing just the flat field. Uh, let me talk a little bit about some structures in the flat field. You see these bright dots. Those are pieces of dust on the scintillator. And yesterday I removed the scintillator and did, there, there were a lot more. I did my best to get rid of them. Um, this is not as good as it ought to be, but um, I didn't have time to do it again. Um, it's all right. They will just lead to some ring artifacts in our images that we'll have to, uh, that we'll have to suppress or live with. Um, the stripes, I told you, those come from the fact that along the length of the mirror, it, it's, it's not completely flat or completely smooth, uh, smoothly varying along a curve, but there's sort of high frequency um, ups and downs, and, and those cause focusing and defocusing effects of the x-rays, leading to these bright stripes. But you can see, you know, just as you're looking at this image, this is updating. Um, you know, at, at many tens of frames a second. Well, it's, it's, it's actually updating, it's collecting at 130 frames a second. Image J here is updating at 50 or 60 frames a second. But you don't see these things moving. It seems to be pretty rock solid. Um, if somebody with a heavy footstep walks by the hutch where this mirror is located, or, or if they open and close the shutter on the other beam line, you will, you will see these things jiggle a little bit, but they're pretty stable, which means they should normalize out from the flat fields. You also see some darker areas here. Those are caused by um, some sort of defects in the mirror. I don't know if they're you know, defects in the coating. This is a silicon, it's a single crystal of silicon 1.2 meters long and about 50 millimeters in the other two directions. And it's uh, highly, highly polished and then it's coated with platinum. 
And I, I don't know if these are defects in the platinum coating or defects in the mirror underneath, um, but they are, you know, the reflectivity isn't the same in these points. And I suspect the spectrum of the x-rays bouncing off of these areas that are dark is also different because they don't normalize out and they lead to ring artifacts in the images. So the pink beam does have more ring artifacts because there are more defects than the mono beam. I mean, one of the things is with these dust particles, um, if I were only measuring a smaller sample that was maybe four millimeters in diameter, I could find a region on this scintillator with no dust particles. Um, but we're trying to do a pretty big field of view right now and getting the scintillator clean everywhere is more difficult. Okay, so let's move the sample back in. Could I ask a quick question? Yeah, Sorry please. To interrupt. No, how no often? Problem. How often are you collecting flat fields? Is it uh, just okay. one for a pink beam? What I'm doing is that that's that's adjustable on this screen. So I can say I want to collect my flat fields at the beginning or the end or both or none. Um, okay. So right now I'm using both. So I'm going to collect, and then when it collects the flat fields, you can tell it how many flat fields to collect. So I, I'm doing 10. So it's going to do 10 at the beginning, 10 at the end. And in the data processing, it, it just averages together all 20 flat fields. Okay. Um, Thank you. And then you can, you can tell it, you know, which axis to move to get the sample out of the way. You can say you want to move X or Y or both. And if you're, and if you're moving Y, then you also have a Y in and out position. Right now we're just moving X. If you have a longer scan, like in the monochromatic mode, would you yes. want to take flat fields in the middle of that scan, or is that not something that you really do? I, you know, I used to do that, um, and then I actually used to interpolate the flat fields, you know, uh, 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 you make the assumption that whatever's changing is linear with time. Um, but that actually led to more problems than it solved, because okay. um, then whatever ring artifacts you have are not constant with time and, and the ring artifact removal doesn't really do a very good job. My, my, in my, the flat fields in the monochromatic beam are exceedingly stable. Um, okay. and, and one of the things that we do in the processing is that in addition to normalizing to the flat field, um, you know, you can, what I do is for each row uh, or each slice, if I, I've got air here and I've got air over here, I can average those two airs together and draw a straight line through that and say that's actually a, a straight line between those two averages across the sample and say that's I zero. So it's a secondary normalization that should cancel out things that are, de are time dependent as long okay. as they kind of happen as horizontals, you know, they're even on both sides mm -hmm. of the image. But yeah, good question. Thank um, you. Okay, so, on, uh, and then here we can tell it how we want to also collect the dark fields, which would be, that's the image you would get if, there's, if there were no x-rays. Um, and one way to do that is actually to close the shutter and collect an image. Um, for this camera, it turns out that at these exposure times, it's basically a constant value in all the pixels of 64, and we don't actually need to collect the dark fields. I just put in this value, and it'll use that as the dark uh, current. But if, if you were using a really long exposure time or there was structure in your camera for the dark field, then you could say, I want to collect dark fields at the start or the end or both. Um, so there's a, a, a beamline specific display um, where we can enter the sample information. This is already correct. It's sample MM5001. It's 40 millimeters from the sample to the scintillator. The mirror is one and a half milliradians, and I have a 0.25 millimeter copper filter. Um, actually, these numbers, that, that distance, that angle, and this filter, it can actually read those from the beamline control epics process variables. So it's in there redundantly, but it's convenient to have it here because it's a text file. You don't have to decode the HDF5 file to see it. 
uh, some information about the scintillator and the, and the pixel size, the optics that we're using. So this is the Nikon macro minimum focus, no tube. Um, and then some information about Doug and, and uh, the proposal and the experiment safety form number and that kind of stuff. Um, that gets this, this, all this information gets recorded both in a text file that's easy to look at and also within the HDF5 data file that is being saved by the camera control software. Um, okay, and then here we can tell it the, um, the directory to save the data in. And if you type a new, a new uh, directory here, it'll create that directory for you. And also a base file name um, that it is gonna put in that folder. So this is sample MM5001. Um, but I've, I've already collected one data set on this, which I called A. So I'm gonna collect a second data set, which is B. And, um, and it's actually gonna, excuse me, create a couple of files. It's gonna create an ASCII file with all that metadata in it. And it's gonna create an HDF5 binary file. And you know, once, once all the metadata is right and the scan parameters are right, we can just start the scan here. So I'm gonna hit start scan. So now what it's gonna do is move the sample out, collect 10 flat fields, move the sample in and begin to rotate it and collect the projections. So it's already um, um, a third of the way done, halfway done. Okay, now it's done rotating, it's moving the sample out, collecting 10 more flat fields. Moving the sample back in, and then it, it drives it back to the start position to zero degrees, if, if that's what you told it to do. You can, you can tell it, do you wanna to return to the start at the end or not? Um, on, like on the big press that, that we do the high pressure tomography, those rotation stages are really, really slow, and there's nothing to prevent it from spinning in one direction forever. You know, there's no cable wind-up problem. So um, we don't return those to the start. We just do the next scan from the angle where the last one finished because it's a heck of a lot faster. But for this, obviously, the rotation stage is quite fast. Um, this, one, this one can go 30 degrees a second. The new stage I got, um, it can go much faster than that. I think right now it's running 40 degrees a second, but it'll go faster. So we can, in, with that new stage, we could collect tomography data sets in, in a second um, it, with limited number of projections because the camera isn't that fast. Um, but at 160 frames a second, we could do 900 projections in five seconds. So, you know, you can do some slow, re, you know, relatively slow time resolved um, studies with this. Okay. Um, so that's how you collect one data set. And think, why don't we now collect a stack of data sets so we could image this sample at multiple heights. Um, so Let's, let's start at minus, it, it can only go to minus five millimeters. So let's start at minus four. And we calculated, I've now forgotten what I said. The field of view uh, vertically is 5.85 millimeters. So let's collect a stack where we're moving it 5.5 millimeters. So in other words, we're gonna collect this height, then we're gonna move the sample up vertically 5.5 millimeters and collect it again. So there'll be about 300 microns or about 60 pixels of overlap um, between the two images. So when we stitch them together, um, you know, we've got some overlap between them. So if I set, my um, step size to move the motor to 5.5 millimeters and now move by 
um, that's now the height. And then if I move another 5.5, I'm there. And another 5.5, I now uh, down into that plasticine um, at the bottom. Um, so I moved it all together um, three times, right? So there's so that would be four data sets. So there's minus four. Um, and actually, I'm going to go back up. So when I'm down, I think the, 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 the sides on this are pretty straight, and it looks like they're pretty vertical. Uh, but I just want to make sure that when I rotate 180 degrees at when the sample's this high up, um, that it also stays in the field of view. Or Okay, it's a little wider than the field of view down here. I've lost the air on both sides. Uh, well, it looks like actually it's, yeah, it's not quite um, vertical. So I'm going to move it over a little bit. So we've got, you know, not, it was pretty good at the top, um, but now I'm going to move it there. So it's it's moving out of the field of view on, on both sides, but not much. So I just want to keep as much of the sample in the field of view as I can. I'll go back down. So each time I click here, the sample's moving by, rotating by 45 degrees. Okay, that looks pretty good. So now I'm gonna go um, here and tell it we wanna collect data set C. And um, because we're doing a stack, I need to, um, tell it that each one should have a different number. So on my HDF5 here, I'm gonna tell it that don't just use the name I gave you, but also use the number. Um, uh, a, a, a file number. Um, so it'll be, you know, 001, 002, 003, and so on. And And now I'm going to use this, what's called the Epic scan record to scan that vertical motor, which is M90, M motor 90 on our beam line. And I'm going to do a relative scan from where we are, which is minus four. Um, step, and I'm going to tell it to end at, what was it, 12.5? And I want um, four points. No. Um, Oh, it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's three points. It, it does, it's going to move it three times. Okay, so that's saying it's going to start at zero, um, end at 12.5 with a step of 5.5. Um, and every time it moves the motor, it's going to, it's going to set this epics process variable to one, which basically means it's pressing this button. And so I think we're ready to go. Let's try it. scan.
Oh, nope. I did it wrong. Because I did a relative scan, I needed to start at the lower position. Okay, so it's done and I aborted the scan so it shouldn't do another one. It, yeah, it's just done. So what I did, made a mistake. Uh, if it had been an absolute scan, it would have moved to the beginning, but it wasn't. It was a relative scan. So um, I need to be at the correct height for the beginning, which is minus four. Um, and now it's saying, um, you've already got a data set there by that name. Do you want to overwrite it? And I'll say yes. So I'm going to go look in this folder where we're saving it. Ah. Oh, we're, we're not saving in the pink folder. We're saving it in this folder. Okay. So now it's done number um, C001. And it's got a config file here, which is the ASCII file, and a data file, which is about seven gigabytes. And now it's um, doing the next scan. It just, uh, at, at now it's at 1.5 vertically. And it's now collecting data set two. Move the sample vertically again, doing data set three. It should have done one more. What did I do wrong? Well, it doesn't matter for for this. Um, I, I think it. I think it didn't go to the last height because it did minus four, and then it did this one, and then it it's, it only did three. It didn't go to here, but but that's okay. I think something doesn't look right in that scan record. Um, Okay, but we, we just collected 18 gigabytes of data here, or 21 gigabytes of data here. Um, and I think what we should do next maybe is, is measure another sample, and then we'll go over and do the reconstructions. The, the, the measurement is, as you saw, it's pretty quick. Um, so this was the melt sample. Um, and I have another sample um, that's about the right size here. Um, that's a breccia sample. So I'm going to go out to the beam line 
and uh, change the sample and I'll probably be back in about five minutes Are there any questions? Maybe we could chat while Mark is uh, setting up the sample. Um, Yan Bing, this is Yue. Yes, hi. Hi. Um, I have a question. Um, so it's not so critical. Looks like it's not so critical. Where is the rotation center, uh, rotation axis within the sample, right? I see right. Mark just roughly aligned uh, zero degree and 90 degree. As so. long as you have air on both sides, you should be okay. 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 Yeah. So air is your reference. As long as you have the, the on both sides, you have the air and you then uh, the system, uh, the software can calculate the uh, absolute contrast, then you should be okay. 
And in fact, it's a, actually sometimes you can see even for this sample, it's impossible to find the rotation center. Right, right. Yeah. That's not critical. Okay. All right. So. Okay, I'm back. Um, uh, does anybody have any questions um, before we go on to the next sample? Yeah, we had just one. Uh, we could continue to ask questions. I don't know what, who would have questions now. Oh, did you answer the question or? or? Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Question was uh, whether we have, it's critical to have the rotation center, the true rotation center, exactly at the rotation center of the system. And so, as you already yeah. said, or as, as long as we have both sides with air, we should be fine. Right. And, and the, um, when we reconstruct, um, we do need to know exactly what pixel the rotation axis is in. Um, but having it somewhat off center in the collection, uh, I mean, just not in the center of the field of view. That's that's not important. Um, it's just, yeah, as Yemba said, if if the sample if it's too far off, then it's going to be hard to keep the sample in the field of view. Okay, thank you. Sure. Um, okay, so now I've got um, another sample in. This one is uh, Doug's G eight nine zero one which was a Suevite, Suevite? I don't even know how you pronounce it, though. Suevite, I think. Suevite, right? <laughs> yeah. okay. That's, that's a new term for me. Uh, it's, slash it's a, yeah, I have to be careful with that because the impact community, uh, they only want to apply it to a certain crater, but it's a general term for the kind of the brush and the melt mixed together. Yeah. Uh, okay, thanks. Um, okay, so now um, I've put this new sample on. It's, uh, I need to do the same thing we did before in terms of centering it. Um, so this is at zero degrees. So that's going to be um, this control here. That looks good. One more, go to 90. kind of sloped up here, so it's probably better to do this a little further down. Okay. Well, that's 90. Where we have a problem here is at 135. It doesn't, no, it almost fits. So let me just see if we, that's pretty close. And you can see this sample has a lot more um, <clears throat> uh, heterogeneity in terms of highly absorbing grains. Um, so the, the contrast is pretty good here. Okay, um, so now we want to go make a new folder. So this is going to be uh, G8901. Actually, I want to put these where they belong, which is in the pink folder. And so then, 
let me go make sure there's what the any files in there right now are there's nothing there I haven't done any pink beam measurements on this sample so we can start with a and basically just do the same scan that we did before um, if it's really going to end at 12.5 it should be four points oh no oh no the oh no I see the problem I I was doing a relative start position and an absolute end position that's the problem I want to do um the uh relative end position is 5.5 times 3 which is 16.5 right there we go <clears throat> that was user error okay um so now we want to go to minus four and then absolute position 12.5 is down in the plasticine yep so So I think we're ready to start to scan. While this is collecting, anybody have any questions? Mark, this is Travis. Um, thank you for putting this on. Do you have any comments regarding scintillator choice or scintillator for beam pink spectrum versus monochrome spectrum um we've been pretty happy with the these lutetium aluminum garnet scintillators um they're you know much more they're much higher z i mean we initially for many years we used um yag yttrium aluminum garnet um but but you know yttrium significantly lower atomic number than lutetium and uh so the lutetium gives better stopping power and um so that the, the x-rays stop sooner in it and you get better resolution um the this scintillator is 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 really two this is um 250 micron thick so when we start to go to at this field at this magnification it's fine the depth of focus effects are not significant but at at a at a at a micron or two resolution this is too thick so we're getting we're not getting as sharp an image as we should so what we should do is use a thinner scintillator you know maybe 30 micron um the problem is that when the then with the monochromatic beam that becomes so inefficient that the data collection times go way up so that's a trade-off we could probably get away with the thinner scintillator with the pink beam and um you know the, the collection times would go up but as you see it's so fast 
um, for, for many things, that's not important. It, it would be fine. So um, did, did you have any anything else specific in mind? I was speaking more also to the, the choice of scintillator for uh, either different resolutions, different phenomena, or sort of data collection or, or quantification uh, within the tomography, um, reconstructed tomography. Um, would switching out two particular uh, scintillators give you a contrast in the reconstructions that would give you, let's say, two data points to, to compare against? Um, no, I don't think the scintillators shouldn't really have any effect on the reconstruction. I mean, they're they're basically just you know how efficient is it and how sharp is it, um, and so I don't think it would it doesn't really affect how it reconstructs except for the the time it takes to collect and the quality you know potentially one scintillator might be sharper. Like for instance, definitely when I went to the LUAG with, I, this was back when I was using monobeam only. When I went to the LUAG at let's say 33 keV, cause we did a lot of work at the iodine edge with the hydrology people. The LUAG was significantly better images, all other things being equal because the x-rays stopped sooner and we didn't have a depth of focus problem, a depth of focus problem. Um, and you know, there, there, like, there is cesium iodide is is even higher mean atomic number than lutetium aluminum garnet. Lutetium is very high atomic number, but of course, aluminum and oxygen are not. Um, so, but cesium iodide has problems that it's hygroscopic, and so it's harder to keep it in good shape. Do you have well, any issues with the um, the scintillator? um actually changing uh crystallographic properties uh, as it's exposed to the harder or perhaps higher energy beams uh, the, that are no, around this APS. stuff this stuff see i mean it seems to be really rad hard you know it's a single crystal um i i i've seen no problems with it what you there is a subtle problem that i haven't seen described in the literature which is that it actually gets more sensitive as it's exposed to x-rays for a while. And so if, if I took a flat field where I covered half the image with the slits and the other half was seeing the beam, and it doesn't matter if it's monochromatic beam or white pink beam, then when I open up those slits for the, the place where the beam has been for previously is brighter than where the slits were. And it takes, let's say 10 minutes for it to get to a uniform sensitivity. So for some reason, you know, you expose it to beam and it like pumps it to become more optically, more fluorescent intensity. Um, and you can imagine that, that you know, if, if that's happening as you put a dark part of your sample in, that it could be leading to artifacts because the scintillator, um, you know, gets uh, less sensitive when it's exposed to darker areas and more sensitive when it's exposed to brighter areas. But I, I don't know how significant an effect that is in in real data collection. But I definitely have to let the thing warm up with the right size beam for you know ten minutes before I start collecting data. And I don't know if other scintillators have that problem or not. Thank you. Yep. Okay, so I think we've got two data sets now. Um, why don't we take another break and then we'll go, um, well, I, yeah, let's take a five minute break and um, I'll switch to the data processing computer and we can go through the reconstruction for and uh, data processing for the next hour or so. All right. So I'll see you in five minutes. Okay, um, so <clears throat> you've already seen, we collected the data. We got radiographs of the sample as we rotate from zero to 180 in small steps. We collected a bunch of flat fields. We didn't collect background images or dark fields. Uh, so now what we need to do is, is compute, you know, I over I zero, which is image minus background or dark field divided by flat field minus background. 
So then we're going to have I0, I over I0 for every pixel in every projection. With this detector, we got 1920 by 1200 pixels, 1800 projections. So we've got 4.15 billion measurements of I over I0, different places in the sample. Then what we do is we convert each row of the detector. So if you think about a row on that detector, it's one slice through the sample um, to what's called a sinogram, which is X versus theta. Um, we take the logarithm because it's the log of I over I zero um, that we need to reconstruct with absorption. We filter that sinogram with a high pass filter and then we reconstruct by back projecting from X, Y theta space to X, Y, Z space, and then analyze the resulting reconstructions. So the first thing we do is we've got a flat field and a raw image, and um, we wanna convert that into a normalized projection where we've See, this image is dark at the top and dark at the bottom, so is the flat field, but when we normalize, it's nice and uniform now. So now we take, this is the raw sinogram. We take the logarithm, and it looks like this, and, and this, is, this is a sinogram, so that's X, so that's the position across the sample for one slice as a function of theta. It's called a sinogram because any point on the sample will describe a sine wave um, in, this, in this view. Uh, and then you pass that sinogram through a high pass filter. And there's you know, different filters that people use, Chef Logan filter, Ramlac filter, different filters. Um, <clears throat> but they're all high pass filters. So then the reconstruction, which is the, the, the sort of non-obvious step, um, conceptually it's easiest to think about back projection, although the, the technique that we're actually using is a little bit different. So imagine that you took the first row of this, sign, of, of this filtered sinogram here and considered it to be a mask through which you are passing, let's say, visible light. So the dark areas, you know, it's dark, and the, and the areas that it's light, it's light on the project, on the ray that's passing through. So that would be the first projection. Now you go to the next angle, and you project that from that angle. And and then you add them together and you do that again and again. So this is taking 25 projections from zero to five degrees. And, um, you know, obviously in the first one, it's just a bunch of horizontal stripes. But now when you project here, things are adding, either either adding or subtracting um, as you project and, and add that image back across the entire reconstruction plane here. So this is when you've taken 225 projections, zero to 45 degrees, 90 degrees. Now you're, you know, you're kind of starting to see the sample, even though you've only collected 90 degrees or treated 90 degrees of data. This is 135 degrees of data. And finally, when you've taken all 900 projections in this case, from zero to 180 degrees, you get a very nice looking reconstruction here. of that one slice. And then the, the, the reconstruction is basically just doing that operation on all however many slices you've got, 12, well, 1020 in today's data. This shows the effect of the filters on reconstruction because it's called filtered back projection, but we could do it with no filters. So this is the sinogram. I've taken the logarithm, but I haven't applied any filter. And this is what the reconstruction looks like. You see, it's, it's, it's kind of, um, it's very blurry and it's, it's not uniform in its intensity distribution. If, if we do a Shep Logan filter, but just a very short filter, a length 10, um, 
you know, now the, the sinogram is, is, um, is, you can see that it's, it looks like it's been high pass filtered, it has, and the reconstruction is now looking um, considerably better. We've got these two bright iron oxides, presumably in it, um, uh, but it still has a sort of a dome shape. It's, it's dim on the edges and bright in the center. Uh, and as we increase the length of that filter that's passed over the data, the reconstructions get better and better. So this is now a length of 100, and then finally a length of 1,000. And, and now we've got you know, a very nice looking reconstruction here where we're seeing not just, um, you know, this isn't a uniform object, it's got bright and dark areas in it, in addition to these bright, you know, presumably iron oxides. Okay, so that's what the filter length, this is how many, you know, how does it vary with how many projections we took? So this is collecting just 45 projections, so four degree steps. And we see the object, but there's a lot of artifacts in terms of these streaks going across um, the image. If we, if we do 90 projections, so two degree steps, it starts to look better. 180 projections, it's definitely looking better. 360, so we got half degree steps. It looks pretty darn good. Um, and this is finally in this data set, this was collected quite a few years ago. You know, this is 720 projections um, where it looks quite nice. Um, the, the, the last thing I wanna talk about is, is the effect of the rotation center on the reconstruction. So, you know, that rotation axis will project onto a specific column in the detector or in the sinogram and determining that position is very important. Really, you know, it helps to have sub-pixel accuracy. So this is with the rotation the reconstruction. If the rotation center is where I think it's optimum in this case, which was pixel 343.5. And notice that these iron oxides are, you know, kind of equant and there aren't a lot of streaks coming off them. This is what happens if I guess that the, if the rotation, if I use a rotation axis of 342. So it's only off by one and a half pixels. Notice that these iron oxides now look like crescents with a dark streak coming out of the left side and a bright streak coming out of the right side. If I go the opposite direction and say the rotation axis is, is at 345, so plus one and a half pixels, I have the streaks, but now it's dark on the right and bright on the left. So if, if you're manually optimizing the rotation center, figuring out where it is in your reconstruction, it really helps to have some bright objects like this in there because then it's pretty easy to just manually figure out where it is. Whereas if you're looking at this lower contrast material, it's much harder to see. Actually, if you look up at the very top, you can see that there's a streak coming off here, which did not occur when we had it at the right location. So there's a bright streak going off to the left here and a bright streak going off to the right. So sometimes the edges of the sample can be used to figure out the best rotation axis as well. Um, but actually I've got software now that can do this in automated way by using a figure of merit called the entropy so if you reconstruct this image and this image and you measure, and the best one, and you measure the entropy of the image, and the entropy is, is really, it's basically just um, determine, it, it tells you how sharp the histogram is. So you take a histogram of, of these images and um, you compute a figure of merit based on that I'm um, um, basically just the log of the sum of the log of the intensities of the histogram. You get something called the entropy. And this is now plotting for two slices, one near the top of the sample and one near the bottom of the sample, what the entropy looks like as a function of rotation center. And you see that it goes through a clear minimum for both slices. Um, and, and ideally, those slices, those minima should be at the same location, which means that the rotation axis is projecting onto the same pixel all the way from the top of the sample to the bottom. If the rotation axis is tilted with respect to the columns of the CCD, 
then you'll get a, a rotation centers that don't perfectly line up that however is correctable and and you can correct that by rotating each image slightly um, so the rotation axis is, axes are in the same pixel okay so this is how we're actually going to process the data today uh, we're going to use a python program based on tomopy to do the pre-processing step the pre-processing is the normalization to the flat fields and the dark kind and that's going to read the hdf5 file and that contains the dark fields the flat fields and the projections do the subtraction and the normal average the flat fields do the normalization and then it's going to write that out to a 16-bit net cdf file um, that will be read in in the next reconstruction step the reconstruction is done in this idl software um, an IDL GUI that reads the normalized file written in the previous step and calls C++ code that does the actual reconstruction using an, a Fourier transform based reconstruction algorithm and that re writes the reconstructed data to a 16-bit netcdf recon.volume file and this GUI provides tools for optimizing several of the parameters and provides quick visualization Okay, so that's it for the PowerPoint. And um, now what I want to do is share the screen from the reconstruction computer, which is Supra. Okay, so this is now the reconstruction computer that I showed you out at the Beamline uh, earlier. It's also a dual monitor display. So I'm gonna bring this over and um, let's go to the, um, actually first I'm gonna take, oops. That's okay. Um, I'm going to take the um, rename that. So now what I'm doing is copying the data from the file server where we um, collected it um, over to the Oh, that's not, I'm sorry. That's not the data set I wanted. When we collected the MM5001, we did it not in this pink folder. So I'm going to copy that over. And that's now going to be that whole stack of data that we collected um, for the MM5001. And then the other one I put in the pink folder, the G, this should be a stack as well. Yes. So I'm going to copy that folder here. And if I look in this MM5001, it's copied. We, we did one that wasn't a stack, B, and then we did um, the stack that was C, one, two, three, four, etc. So it's now, let's, let's reconstruct. Um, the the first one the c001 and that's up a level so this python uh software that does the initial 
I, ultimately, I'm going to use Tomo Pi for all the steps of this. This IDL program is older. It's it's I, I I wrote I've been using it for many years, but I'm the only one who uses it, and I want to switch to Tomo Pi, which is a community effort. Um, and its pre-processing is fine. Un unfortunately, they've got a grid rec reconstruction, and so do I. I had it way before they did, and mine gives better reconstructions. And it's nominally should be the same code. And so I have to figure out why TomoPy reconstructions aren't as good as the ones I get with my um, IDL-based software. So for now, I'm still using the IDL-based software for the reconstructions and TomoPy for the pre-processing because the TomoPy is way faster for the reconstruction. And it knows how to read these HDF5 files, um, which my software doesn't know how to read right now. And it, it may never because I'd like to get rid of it. Okay, so Oh, I didn't go up enough. Okay, so what I tell it here is I want to run this preprocessing software, um, preprocess13bm.py on this base file name. And so what that's going to do is, is there's, um, you know, there's an H5 file there and a, and a config file. It's reading the H5, HDF5 file and it's, um, so it, it, it actually took only, um, uh, it says reading data at seven, 1957 and um, it, it was done seven seconds later. It actually, once this runs once, typically it only takes four seconds to read the data. Uh, now it's normalizing the data. Then it's going to convert to a 16-bit integer and write it out as a, um, a volume file, this netcdf volume file. And then we're going to read that into this program and reconstruct it. And once, once it's done one, I could be pre-processing the second one while I'm reconstructing the first one. So I can overlap these operations to speed it up. This machine is, is a, has got, um, it's got 128 gigs of memory and 48 cores and, um, and, a, and a super fast RAID solid state disk. So it's, it's, it's a, a good machine for processing. You don't really need, I, in fact, for the reconstruction, I'm, not, I'm only using eight cores. You don't need 48 cores, um, but you do need quite a bit of memory because you're gonna have big arrays in memory and, and often multiple big arrays in memory at once. Okay, so now this is done. Since that's done, I can start it pre-processing number two and Meanwhile, I'm going to go read the volume file we just created. So this is the normalized data. Okay, it's read it in. And one thing I can do is just look at that data So that's now one of the, um, that's the projection at 90 degrees normalized. And you now see that most of the, the, the stripes are gone. I can see a little bit down here. So they might've moved a little bit during this projection. Um, if I tell it here um, to display, a maximum intensity of a thousand and make a movie. This is now watching the sample rotate. So it's not reconstructed, it's just the normalized data. Um, 
watching the sample rotate 180 degrees. Uh, but like I say, you can see that the the uh, the flat fields are pretty well corrected here, but not these dust particles. We're still seeing those bright dust particles, so they haven't normalized out. Okay. So that's that's what the the sort of re, the the corrected data look like, and now what we want to do is to reconstruct, and we're we're going to reconstruct a slice slice 102 that's up near the top, and slice 918 that's down near the bottom. I, I choose slices that are 10% from the top and bottom because sometimes there's not good data right there if the beam is running out. Um, and I'm going to guess that the rotation center is 960 because that's halfway the it's 19 it's half of 1920 that would be in the center of the field of view. So I'm going to say reconstruct slice. And IDL crashes every time this stupid computer goes to sleep. IDL dies it dies when it tries to load the shareable library. And this never happened. This just started happening. It's some like Windows update or something. Windows or, just updated. Because <laughs> like, I'm having a lot of trouble too. Um, I, I don't know if it's that, you know, our sh the shareable library is sitting on a Linux file server. So it's possible when it goes to sleep, the Linux connection is lost. I don't know. It's not a big deal. I just got to launch that thing again. And I got to, there's one setting I want to set. Um, Right, I gotta now browse to that file, which is in D data Tomo user uh, Schmidt and then 5001. There we go. Okay, so that's what the reconstruction looks like. And you can see that we've got exactly those crescents that I was talking about because the rotation center is not right. I need to zoom this a half because it wasn't fitting in the, in the window. So let me do it again. So now you'll see the whole sample, but it looks like a whole bunch of moons facing left. Um, so I know the rotation axis must be bigger. So I'm going to guess that it's 970, and that looks pretty good. Um, you know, those those oxides now don't have streaks, and so it, the rotation center is not in the in the center. It's 10 pixels off, which is about 50 microns off from the center. Um, and now that I know, so. And, and I can reconstruct that bottom slice, also guessing that it's a, at 970. And that looks pretty good as well. Um, these, I can make these images a little, oh, that's auto scaled, I see. I wanna scale it from say minus 200 to maybe 2000 or, oops, minus 200 to uh, maybe 2,500. This is just the grayscale for the display. It has nothing to do with the data. It's just so that I see a, a good contrast in the image. Yeah, that looks pretty nice. Um, <clears throat> and now I could, I could optimize the rotation center. I'm pretty sure that it's near 970, but it might not be exactly 970. I'm going to optimize over a range of six pixels in quarter pixel steps. And so what that's going to do is, is going to, it's going to reconstruct 24 times each of these two slices um, with different rotation centers. And then because I've selected entropy here, it's going, to, it's going to analyze the entropy of each of those reconstructions and plot it and choose the point where there's a minimum. So this takes a few seconds while it does those reconstructions. Okay. So 
it, these are the reconstructions at the optimized point. Um, and you see it, it found a nice clear minimum. Sometimes it, it won't. Uh, if you have phase contrast data or if your sample goes way out of the field of view, sometimes this automated technique won't work. Um, I've even seen it find a maximum at the correct place. But on nice samples like this, it almost always works. Um, and what it says is that it found the rotation center in the upper slice at 970.5 pixels and in the lower slice at 970.75. So they're, they're a quarter pixel apart. That is definitely good enough. Um, and what it's gonna do now when I say reconstruct all the slices is it's going to interpolate the rotation center um, and extrapolate so that it, it uses the variation of the rotation center with height um, determined by these two points. If it was off by you know a, more than a pixel, then I would fix it by pressing this button, which says correct rotation tilt. So that will rotate each image by this is an angle, right? It's how many it's it's a quarter of a pixel out of 808 pixels. So it's an angle and it'll rotate each image by that angle. And once it does that, the rotation axis should be exactly the same point. A rotation center should be exactly the same point, top and bottom. But I don't need to do that step because the, me the mechanical alignment of the system, and this is a mechanical alignment um, where I have to get the rotation axis parallel to the columns of the CCD. Uh, of the CMOS detector. It's pretty darn good. So I'm not gonna fix it. So I'm just gonna say reconstruct all. So now using those rotation centers, it's gonna go reconstruct the whole thing. And this takes about 30 seconds, 30, 40 seconds, something like that. So this, if, if I look at my uh, task manager here for Windows, this is using um, a quarter of the CPU or roughly. So it's using, it's not using all 48 cores, but it's using some fraction of those cores. I actually deliberately tell it not to use all the cores because if you use all the cores, it's actually slower. Um, and that has to do with, you know, the way caching works in a multi-core CPU like this. So eight cores is about right. Okay, so now it's completely reconstructed all a uh, thousand and twenty slices. So now I can read in that reconstruction, which is this C001 recon dot volume file. And if we look in that um, folder, here, there's the recon volume. So the raw data was about 6.8 gigabytes and the reconstruction is about 7.3 gigabytes. That alone tells you that you've somewhat undersampled because you know if the, if the initial file is, if the, if the raw data is smaller than the final data, you, you're, you're, there's no free lunch. Um, but we haven't undersampled by much. Uh, okay, so now if I say, show me a slice in, now the, the data that we just read in is 1920 by 1920. That's, it's square in the, in the horizontal direction of the detector and it's however many slices, so we have 1020. So if I look in the Z direction, that's gonna be a slice. And by default, it gives you the center slice. So if I say display slice, I'm now looking at the center slice through the sample. And remember this, the reconstructed data here are the X-ray linear attenuation coefficient. Um, so bright is absorbing, you know, that's this bright grain that I'm on here, or I zoom in on. Um, is, is probably a, an iron oxide, I would guess. You know, it could be a sulfide. Um, it's something high Z. And these uh, these here 
Uh, Doug, do you have any idea what these are? They're like lath shaped. Yeah, crystals. no, I, I think are, it's something that's uh, crystallized out. I don't actually know, you know. Okay. So, uh, that's yeah, I mean, I don't know. Figure. You know, it, it, when I and first saw them, I kind of thought maybe they're biotite, you know, because it's no, like platy, no. but but that's not right because they'd be high. They biotite has I would have iron in it. It'd be more absorbing than the yeah. matrix, probably. Yeah. So I don't know if it's some kind of. I'm just guessing plagioclase or something. Yeah, but, it could uh, be a yeah. plage. I mean, there are lath shaped plages. Right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and I, mean, I, I think it came, you know, it must have cooled in the melt and yeah. Okay. Um, so now that was a slice in the Z direction. I could, I could make a movie in the Z direction. So this is now flying through all the slices in Z from the top of the sample to the bottom of the sample. Now you you do see these ring artifacts that we were talking about the, re, the 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 couple of slices that we that it happened to choose for the testing of you know when we optimized the center those didn't have too bad ring artifacts but some of them do and I'm going to show you how how we could fix that at least to some extent So it looks like the very last slice has a significant ring artifact. Um, we can also look at the data here in, you know, this is a simple viewer, but we can view it in, in each of the three orthogonal directions. So this is now a vertical slice through the data um, parallel to the X-ray B propagation direction. Um, so it's like I was standing in the doorway of the hutch looking at the sample. And, and we can, um, you know, we can step through this data just one slice at a time by using the arrow keys. Here. So the black's going to be pores. Ex except you got to be careful that what black, like this black right here, that's a ring artifact. That's, that's that place in the mirror that looked darker. So that is not a pore. Okay. Uh, and you got to be, we're going to have, you're going to have to be careful to say which of these, like this one is definitely a ring artifact. See how it's black on the left and bright on the right. Um, so uh, one thing you can tell is that if they're ring artifacts, then as we go through this as a movie, um, they will be continuous and they'll get bigger and smaller because they're rings as we fly through. See how they're, they're moving purely left, right, those dark yeah. things, that's, yeah, yeah. that's ring artifacts, that's not pores. This actually looks like a pretty um, compact sample. I mean, I don't see cracks, I don't see much in the way of pores here. Because I've looked at this before, this isn't different. And there's a vein in it, did you see that? It went, went through? Yeah. Um, and so that's interesting, you know, is, is, is that like a secondary melt or something? I, I'm not sure. Um, and then you can also look at it in the vertical direction, orthogonal to what we just did. You know, that's the X direction. So that's perpendicular to the X-ray beam. Uh, but, but these um, volume files now could be loaded into other viewers. We can read them into ImageJ um, or, you know, other uh, visualization software. Um, that is more sophisticated than this, but this is good good enough for getting a quick look to see, you know, how does the data look? Uh, I am not restarting. Remind me tomorrow. Um, okay, let's go see if we can fix those ring artifacts. So if we go read the volume file again, the, not the reconstructed one, but the just the normalized data. I probably should have done this before I reconstructed it all. Um, but but actually flying through that stack gave you a sense of you know how many ring artifacts there are and how bad they are. Um, so I think the very last slice here, which is 1019, um, reconstruct that. Yeah, that has a significant ring artifact. So let's see if we go to these processing options. So I've got a, an algorithm for reducing the ring artifacts, which basically takes the, it averages all of the rows in the sinogram, so all of the angles, and produces an average sinogram. 
And in general, that should have no high frequency content. It should be quite smooth. Um, and, and, but when it isn't smooth is when one column of the detector is misbehaving relative to its neighbors. When you average, that will come out as, and be a, a significant deviation. So then I, I smooth that averaged sinogram and say anything that's deviating from that smooth diversion is causing a ring artifact. And, and the, the, the thing you can control is how big is that smoothing? And the default that I use is nine pixels. Um, and for minor ring artifacts, like we get in mono beam, um, usually that's enough um, to, to, to fix it up pretty nicely. Um, but that's not, that did not get rid of this ring. So let's do instead a hundred, you know, a much bigger smoothing kernel, um, and then reconstruct that slice again. And you see that ring is basically gone. Um, and, and, and it didn't seem to, um, to introduce other significant artifacts. Um, had this sample, instead of being uh, a rectangle, had it been a cylinder um, that, was that was centered reasonably close to the rotation axis, the border of that cylinder would look like a giant ring artifact. And when you did the ring artifact correction, it would introduce a significant artifact into the image. Um, but in this case, um, putting a big smoothing like that um, it looks like it's it's kind of fixed this problem, at least for this slice, pretty well. So let's try with that ring smoothing. Um, um, well, it doesn't remember that you use different rotation centers, top and bottom. So I'm going to optimize that center again. It's not going to it's not going to come up any different. Okay, it's the same thing we got before. Um, and, but, and now we've got a good rotation center, top and bottom. We've turned on this better ring artifact smoothing. Now we'll reconstruct the whole thing again. And then we'll fly through it in the vertical direction and see, you know, how much have those ring artifacts been suppressed. Do you sacrifice some, uh, when you do that smoothing on the sinograms, do you, I guess, you probably have to sacrifice some resolution, right, or not? Yeah, not really, because you're, you're basically adjusting the intensities of certain columns in the CCD. You're, you're actually, the smoothing isn't applied to the reconstruction. It's applied to figuring out which are the defective columns in the in the CCD and adjusting them. It's not like it replaces them with their neighbors. It just changes their average intensity up and down. So it, it doesn't apply a spatial filter to the reconstruction. Um, oh, so it's, yeah, it's more just a data. Uh, yeah, it's, it's an intensity adjustment yeah. um, on certain detector pixels. Okay, so now it's finished reconstructing all the slices with, with the fix. Let's read that in. And um, now in the, in the Z direction, Let's uh, make a movie again. So there's there's some rings there still, but I think it's the, you know they're significantly reduced. And there are two sources of these ring artifacts, as you saw in the flat field. There's the dust and there's the defects in the mirror. 
And I think the dust is more easily removed. The defects in the mirror, um, the, the data is just wrong and it's harder to fix. Okay, so that looked pretty good. And now let's fly through it in the, in the Y direction. And we could probably do that without scaling it down a factor of two. So this is now one to one. Th that was two by two binned um, in, the, in the Z direction. But, okay, so now we're flying through the sample. So there's one ring artifact and a few that didn't get removed. There's some cracks I see in these in these grains around here. And there's that vein. Yeah, I'm really curious what the, the high density is. And that's a big is. crack. That's a big crack. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I, I think you get the gist of it here. What we would now need to do is, um, you know, there's, there's, there's another data set that, uh, needs to be pre-processed and two more that need to be reconstructed. Once those are all reconstructed, um, we can stitch them together, um, you know, including taking into account the overlap that we had between the, the data sets, the, the 300 microns or so, and um, stitch it together into a giant recon volume that would be, uh, you know, almost 16 millimeters tall, and um, 11 by 11 millimeters uh, in X and Y um, with quite a few voxels of data. Um, but, but rather than spending the remaining 15 minutes on that, let's go reconstruct the one uh, section of the other sample. Um, so that was um, in pink, uh, G, G, there. Yeah, so that's reconstruct the, the top section of this sample. Because this is a breccia, so it's going to look pretty different. Anybody have any questions while we're waiting for this? Uh, I do have a question. Once you have the reconstructed volume, is there a way either on this software or on ImageA that you can quantify the volume of different faces? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, whoops. How did I get an echo? Oh, um, yes, but that's a that's a whole um, that's a whole day in itself, um, which is you know you have to do what's called segmenting the data, right? And and you assigning a voxel to be one of multiple phases. Um, sometimes that's pretty easy. Um, you know, if you only have two phases and they're very different in their linear X-ray absorption coefficient, you can use a simple threshold that says, you know, anything that's brighter than, uh, you know, 0.1 is phase A and anything less than 0.1 is phase B. Uh, the problem is if, if you look in, in this case, um, this is a pretty complicated sample. It's got a bunch of phases in it and, and my guess is if you look at the histogram of the <clears throat> linear attenuation coefficient for many of those phases, they would overlap. 
And so segmenting them is, is um, a more difficult problem. So often the segmentation schemes use both the intensity and the neighborliness of pixels saying, you know, if this pixel is, is probably phase A, that, or, or if you've said this pixel is phase A, then the pixel next to it has a higher likelihood of also being phase A, even though its intensity might say that it's phase B. Um, and, and image J um, out of the box has only fairly simple segmentation. This program has no segmentation, um, uh, but image J has some segmentation, you know, based upon um, intensities and, and some more sophisticated things as well. But, but you, you probably need to look at other packages to do more complicated segmentation. And it's a kind of thing that, you know, there's a, there's a commercial package, actually it's free to academics now, um, called Dragonfly. And, and it's beginning to incorporate machine learning because this is like a perfect place to use machine learning because you know you as the trained operator can go in for a few slices and 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 sort of do it manually you say this is phase a this is phase b this is phase c um and once you train the machine learning it can now you know use what you did on a few training slices to do the rest of the slices. At least that's the idea. And, and I think it can be fairly successful, again, depending on the complexity of the data. All right, so the pre-processing, does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. thank you. Okay. Um, let's, we've got the uh, pre-processing done on this one. So we're gonna go read that volume file. So that's in pink G there. And the rotation center, is really only a function of, um, you know, the setup of the camera and the stage. It really shouldn't change when we change samples, unless we bump something when we change the sample. Um, so we're gonna guess that this sample is also got a rotation center at 970 and tell it to optimize. And um, in this case, they were exactly the same, 970.25 top slice and bottom slice. I got to go back to zoom a half here. Um, so uh, you can see, Doug, this, this stuff has, has got a lot of real porosity in it. Yeah, it's really low velocity, and uh, yeah. I think it's actually there's a lot of alteration in it too. So it would have been sitting above this really hot stuff for a long time with uh, you know a lot of fluids right. coming through. Yeah, um, no, it's and cool. We, we've got the same um, pre-processing and uh, I'm sorry, ring artifact removal enabled here of a hundred. Um, so, you know, once you find the center and you're happy with the ring artifacts, um, you're ready to just say reconstruct all. Over in this part here, there's there's a, this section called movies. You saw me press make movie a few times to fly through a data set. Um, and, and I had the default here was to, to send that movie output to the screen. But you can also send it to uh, a series of JPEG files or a series of TIFF files. If you're writing to TIFF files, you can do them either using this scaling that we've got up here as 8-bit TIFFs, or you could uh, do it unscaled and write out 16-bit TIFFs, which is what you should do if you're going to use those TIFF files for actually quantitative analysis, in, at least in some program that's not limited to 8-bit data. Uh, and then finally, you can write it to an MP4 file, and that's really nice. And, and with MP4, you can tell it how many frames a second and the, the sort of the encoding quality, how many bits per second. 
Um, and that lets you take a data set here that's like, you know, it was eight, seven gigabytes and make a file that's a hundred megabytes, um, which you can put in a PowerPoint. And, and uh, the MP4 quality is, is really pretty good. I mean, obviously it's heavily compressed, you know, it's a factor of a hundred compressed. Um, but it compresses both in the spatial domain and the time domain, which is, you know, th th there's a lot of similarity from slice to slice, and it takes advantage of that. So it's pretty cool that you can you can make these movies that you can then, and they're even, you know, big enough for, to have somebody, your uh, your professor download and look at when you're at the beam line without having to have a viewer to look at the NetCDF files themselves. Uh, okay, so that reconstruction is done. Let's read that in. Um, okay, so we're looking in the, in, okay, let's look in the Y direction. There's a slice. Looks like on this one, it's low enough absorbing, or did I go back to auto? No, I'm still on manual. Let's do like 2000 because it looks kind of dark. That looks better. Could even probably do 1500. That looks good. We're seeing the the, the less absorbing phase is better. Uh, let's go to one to one and uh, make a movie. Yeah, look at all that. I mean, it's just like riddled with holes. That's cool. That's cool. Now, there's a grain with the cracks in it. Right. A lot See? of cracks yeah. and big, yeah. big voids here. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> Mark, do you have any feel for what the, when you have the really uh, high density material, uh, what the density just in a, might be? three or above or you don't know oh really. no because the, remember i said it, the the tomography um linear attenuation coefficient is only linearly um proportional to density and it goes as like the cube of the atomic number so it really depends like how much iron is in the sample um you know the, the amount of iron is going to change the the, the, the values we measure much more than changing the density even by 50%. Okay, yeah. So okay, it's, it's so not a good way to measure density unless you know the composition. And you know, if you have two places in the sample that you know are identical composition, but different density, then the, the x-rays are, are good for telling that. So, so you think they're iron rich regardless then? Is that? Uh... I, yeah, or I, you know, I couldn't even say for sure it's iron, but it's, it's some ato higher atomic number. You right, know, right. Like, yeah. you know, is that melt rich in calcium compared to, you know, the granite is probably richer in sodium and the, mm -hmm. and the, and right. the, and the um, well, I don't know what the composition of that melt is, but if it's basaltic, um, you know, it could have both higher iron and higher calcium right, right. than the granite. Right. Well, there could be a lot of junk, you know, it, it uh, impacted into thick carbonate sequences. Yeah. And uh, so there would be some calcium around there probably too. Right. That, uh, I mean, for that, you, you probably should take a, you know, make a thin section and put it on the microprobe, right. on the electron microprobe right, right. And, yeah. or, or an XRF machine and, and measure. No, I think we'll have to do that. Yeah. Or Chris will have to do that. <laughs> right. And, you know, the stuff that, I mean, that, that breccia does seem really altered. You know, it's, you can tell just holding it in your hand that it's, it's, it's light. It's not dense. Right. And. Right. Um, right. Yeah. And a lot of times I think that alteration, it tends to remove like it, it, what, what's left behind is aluminum oxide. You know, that's the thing that's least soluble when things get 
altered like that so um you know it, oh there although there could be silica left too but but i think you know the sodium and the calcium would, might get leached out okay so now i'm, I'm just doing the next section of this one so now we go read in number two. So this is just the next vertical height in this same sample. And uh, again, we're gonna guess that it's 970, optimize the center. Looks good. And reconstruct the whole thing. So it's uh, it's getting to be uh, five o'clock. Um, I don't think we, we don't need to go through reconstructing it all and, and, and stitching it together. We don't have time to do that. Uh, but that's pretty straightforward. Um, does anybody have any questions, comments? I'm I'm happy to I'm hang impressed around. With how, I'm impressed with how fast it is, right? Yeah. The, the, right. Because uh, we have some experience working on the commercial machines, right? Uh, right. And uh, yeah, it's a yeah, a lot more laborious. <laughs> so. Yeah, you know, I'd be. Have you measured any of these samples on a commercial machine? Well, we did a few years ago. Yeah, and it wasn't. A, it was quite an early model. So uh, okay, uh, I think. Chris yeah, I'm always. You know, that. I yeah. because I just work at the synchrotron and I don't have a lab machine. I'm always interested in knowing, you know, sort of how the competition's doing, and right. you know what what we should be. You know, we don't want to be doing the same thing you can do on a commercial machine. You know, we should be doing things right. that you can only do at a yeah. synchrotron. Well, I mean, and certainly one of those is the high yeah. speed. I mean, yeah. you know, if we were doing the pink beam for dynamics, then that's something that only the synchrotron can do. Right. If you're just right. doing it to be able to collect the data more quickly, that's not a really good reason to use a synchrotron. No, no, no. no we you know, unless it lets out. you do a thousand samples, when, which would be, you know, to do things that wouldn't be feasible at all on a lab machine. Right. Any questions? Oh, there's some stuff in the chat. I haven't looked there. Oh, okay. Nothing interesting. Um, Mark. Yeah. This is Yue. Um, Hi, Yue. I, I have a question. Um, I, I, I think you talk about it. I probably miss it. Um, for the beam, because your sample is like several millimeters, right? Like 11 millimeters or Yeah, something. this one's, these are pretty big samples. In fact, yeah. I had to choose from Doug's samples, I had to choose ones that would fit in the field of view. Okay. I mean, I can make like a 16 maybe millimeter field of view, but then um, the pixels get pretty big. And and then you, you know, the aspect ratio you, you, you lose in the vertical. But go ahead, yeah, it's 11 so, millimeters. Yeah, so the beam size, the beam size has to be bigger than that, right? Uh, it's just a little, yeah. I mean, right now I've got the slits. I, um, in in the hutch, I have the slits set just a little bigger than that. Uh, we said it was eleven point oh something millimeter field of view. We calculated okay. the slits are just a little bit bigger than that. So the beam is just a little bigger than the field of view. Okay, so you basically don't need a um, focusing mirror, right? You just Direct no, beam what, with, with the slit will be good. That's right. That uh, well, the mirror is is serving two purposes in this experiment. It mm -hmm. is rejecting high energy X rays um, that are. I, I'd have to look at those graphs I showed, but maybe above about sixty keV, um, okay. we're 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 getting rid of those photons, um, and that's good because those photons will go right through the sample, they'll, they'll hit the scintillator, they'll make light, but they give no contrast. Um, so, and they'll, they can actually degrade the resolution because they go right through the scintillator too. So it's good, particularly at a machine like the APS, which has very high energy x-rays, to have the mirror to get rid of it. If we were doing this experiment on a 
white beam at NSLS2, we wouldn't need the mirror because their beam just drops off in intensity at higher energies very quickly. Um, but ours doesn't. So the mirror is helpful. The other thing we're using it for is, you know, you saw in our flat field there, um, the, the, the intensity, it varied across the stripes, but it really didn't vary top to bottom in the image very much. Um, and that was a 5.8 millimeter vertical beam. If we didn't be at 60 keV, it wouldn't be that big. We would be well outside the full width half max of a 60 kilovolt beam. Um, and, and so the mirror is helping to make our field of view bigger in the vertical direction, significantly bigger in the vertical direction, which helps, okay. which helps on big samples like this. You know, if you've got a sample that's only four millimeters in diameter and, 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 and thus the beam is only, the camera is only three millimeters tall, then you don't need the defocusing of the mirror, defocusing effect of the mirror so much. Okay. And uh, another one is the resolution of this kind of uh, tomography. Is it de determined by the pixel size of the camera? Um, it can be no better than the pixel size of the camera. Um, okay. I mean, it's, it's not the pixel size of the camera, it's the pixel size of the object as, as imaged onto the camera, right? So right now we happen to be using a one-to-one -one lens. But I can put a 5x object, the, the pixels in my camera are 5.7 microns. So if I put a 1x, I mean, sorry, a 5x objective on the camera with the correct tube length of 200 millimeters, so it's truly 5x, then the image the pixel size on my sample would be like 1.1 microns. Yeah, yeah, right. Um, now I don't believe I would. I would usually. I, I would not promise that we have 1.1 micron resolution. In fact, I know we don't. Um, mm -hmm. And that depends a bit on the energy, um, and um, and the and the and the thickness of the scintillator. Um, uh, so you know, I think we can get two micron, maybe two two and a half micron resolution okay. um, in good. You know, not at very high energy, but at, you know, reasonably low energy, we can get that resolution. Um, um, yeah, so the resolution is more complicated. Um, if we went to a thinner scintillator um, and, and also, you know, higher numerical aperture lenses, you're, you're limited just like you are in an optical. We're using an optical microscope, right? So if you want to get to a half micron resolution with an optical microscope, you need a very good numerical aperture um, lens and um, a big numerical aperture lens. And typically those are not long working distance. So you saw in this setup, we have a 45 degree mirror, which means that with my 5X objective, um, I'm pretty close to the mirror. And if I wanted a higher numerical aperture lens, I would have to get rid of the mirror. Uh, because there's not enough working, uh, numer high numerical aperture lens doesn't have a long working distance. Then the problem is the, the, the objective is, and the camera are directly downstream of the scintillator, no mirror. And now you have to worry about beam damage to your lens and your camera. That's why we have the mirror. Yep. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, Mark, I have a question. I just put it in the chat box, but so obviously this is biased by what I want to do with them. Uh, can we use them to try to look at anisotropy or like distribution of pore sizes or shapes of the pore sizes in kind of a numerical sense? Yes. Um, yeah, there, there are a lot of people that work on, you know, pores in, you know, using tomography to quantify porosity and and to you know then um, take the you know segment the CT images so you know where's where are the pores and where are the um, the, the the grains and then do um, 
a lot of people put those into uh, lattice Boltzmann codes, you know, to predict permeabilities and so on. Um, so yes, and and we've had a, quite a few users who've who've done exactly that. Okay, um, great. You know, often often you're 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 try you're sort of doing things on a statistical basis, right? So you, I, you know, they do th finding the the throat diameters. You know, where is the narrowest region along this pore? along this poor channel. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, that's what I want to look at doing. Okay, that's good news. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions? I kind of have a question. Yeah. Um, so I was kind of wondering on the samples that had a lot of like artifacts and like cracks and such, would there ever be a point where you would consider throwing out that sample for having too many artifacts? Um, okay. I, well, I wouldn't call a crack an artifact. A, a crack is a good, a good, that's what we're trying to image, right? But the, okay. but the ring artifacts, um, yeah, I mean, certainly I, I, we've collected plenty of data that is probably not analyzable. Um, not, not necessarily due to the artifacts so much as um, it wasn't until the user got home that they realized that the signal to noise ratio in the data wasn't sufficient to be able to segment it, for example. Um, I mean, I would guess that in the world there is there are petabytes of unanalyzed CT data. So, you know, one of the things that, you know, that you can collect an awful lot of data as you just saw, right? Um, with, this, with a CT machine, synchrotron or lab CT machine. Um, and, and the speed at which we can collect it and even reconstruct it, right? The reconstruction was slower than the collection, but it wasn't a lot slower than the collection. But the but the analysis is way way slower, and it lags behind um, the the collection and the reconstruction by orders of magnitude. And and you know that's where um, you know it's a computer science problem, um, and 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 it's. There's a cultural problem in, in the sense that, you know, many of the people who are coming to use the Beamline and probably most of you, you come from a small lab where um, the computing resources, hardware wise, and the computing knowledge, um, you know, software programming wise is limited. And, you know, these are becoming like big data problems. And so we need to get, um, algorithms and um and and data flows that are easily accessible um and and running uh you know so that so that we're not just producing data that ends up in the garbage because people couldn't analyze it and it, you know it's really incumbent probably upon the central places like us to be doing that um because uh, i mean Right now, people are just going home with, you know, multiple terabyte drives. And I'm not, you know, I don't know how much of that data ever actually gets fully analyzed. Um, and, you know, we need to be doing more of it here. Um, but but we've, we've been slow to do that because our primary job is to collect the data. Okay. I was just asking, because I do this, I do a lot of segmentation to study okay. the poor um so i was just kind of wondering because we have a data set that i'm trying to analyze that's very full of artifacts so i was just trying to see behind the scenes a little bit but thank you okay well you know what kind of artifacts um i have a lot of rings in the data and also some of the samples are like toward the latter part of the sample you can tell like i guess the like powder like there's a lot of deformation in the corners where there's actually like nothing they're bald or they're missing um uh -huh. a lot of rain and I actually have cracks, but I don't want cracks. I just want the pores. So there's a lot of cracks in the sample as well and lighting issues as well. Okay. 
So it's been challenging, but I've learned a lot right. about the image processing. Was this was was this uh, data collected on a lab machine or a synchrotron or synchrotron? Okay. But we have a lot of the samples, so I know that we have we have those flash drives with all the data. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, like ring artifacts. You know, that's something that it's, you know, if, if, if the reconstruction had a bunch of ring artifacts, well, there's two places in the, in the pipeline where you can remove ring artifacts. You know, what you saw me doing here was removing it essentially in, in, in the, um, in the sinograms before it's reconstructed. And the, the other thing is, you know, you use something that can recognize rings in the reconstruction and remove them there. In my experience, I, I think that's harder, but I, I'm not an expert in it. And, you know, maybe there are good algorithms out there for doing that. Um, you know, obviously those, those are things that in, you know, in some FFT are gonna show up, you know, are gonna show up and you should be able to filter them out. And the question is how well can you do that? Yeah, but, I use a Viso and okay. OGS. Okay, cool. And, 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 and so there is ring artifact removal in that on the on the reconstructed images. Yes. Okay. So Mark, we have a question regarding the recording whether it will become available. I think it will, but oh yeah, yeah. The whole intention is to make the the recording public. I, I, I don't know how big the file is though, right? Uh, I asked it's, Charlie how big that is. Oh, did you stop that or it's still recording? It's still still recording. recording. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I, I asked Charlie if there was a limit on that and he doesn't know of one. You know, it's, it's stored in the cloud somewhere and, you know, by blue jeans and, um, and Argon's paying for blue jeans. So I don't know if there's a limit or not. Okay. So basically with yeah. a link, everybody can have. Yeah, uh, there, there will be a link. Right? Um, that 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 I think often becomes available a couple days later, mm -hmm. and I could just I'll email that out to everybody. Okay. Good. Any more questions? If not, maybe we should call it a day. And uh, thank everybody for attending. Okay. Thanks, Mark. Do you want me to show up to just talk about the samples again tomorrow? Or I wouldn't mind seeing what happens if you run one of the cracked ones, so. <laughs> oh, sure. Um, yeah, give me, what are some suggestions for samples tomorrow? Okay, uh, uh, well, that 147, we've run a lot of stuff on that, mercury pore symmetry, et cetera, et cetera, right? And, oh, the one you just emailed me today? Yeah, yeah, that's why. Okay, uh, yeah, that's yeah. that's a, you know, we're not gonna be able to see the whole thing um, in the field of view, but that'll okay. be an interesting thing to show people anyway. You know, we're, sure. you, you know, we're gonna have uh, some artifacts for that, but I, they're probably not too bad because uh, it's not hugely bigger than the field of view, one of the pieces. I actually right. had a question, you know, a after the workshop, um, I can, you know, do more of the analyses. It, it, is it okay to cut the samples or you want me to image them like they are? No, no, this was basically, I don't really have a good saw yet. I have not set up, right? So, so. Uh, um, uh, oh, so I can my, cut some of them? If you want, go ahead, yeah. Okay. So the, yeah, no, uh, anything there, the, the bigger pieces are back here, right? right? So I just kind of found what was available. I okay, like, I just like didn't know, you know. Chris like, had yeah. been um, cutting them to make cores in that, right? But I right. thought the cores were too big for what you yeah, wanted. Yeah, the cores are too yeah. big, but, and yeah. I don't even have like complete cores. I have some sort of, you could see they were a core. Right. right. Um, so, yeah, I didn't uh, know, you know, these are, you know, how precious these things are. No, 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 those are basically shards left from whatever, cutting or whatever, right? So, okay. so uh, feel free. Okay, uh, yeah, I've uh, got a diamond saw, so I may slice a few of, yeah. you know, uh, uh, of so the high the, priority samples so we can get some good. Yeah, images. Mark, just when you're cutting them, uh, just, just from my own experience, you need to be very careful because they're not very strong. Oh, okay. the granites, yeah. the granitoids, yeah. right, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I won't put a lot of weight on the saw.
Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I mean, like, uh, you know, those melts are pretty strong, right? Yeah. Obviously. But, uh, uh, yeah, the granitoids, no, you could break them with your hand easily, right? So, right. quite friable. Yeah. Right. Well, that's even potentially another way to do it, you know? Yeah. Because <laughs> all I yeah. got to do is get it to, you know, about the right dimension. Yeah. So don't worry. Don't, yeah. Okay. All those are. Uh, I may, I may try just, you know, scoring it and cracking it. Sure. It sure. Be, that'll work. Yeah. Easy. 